she, 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 she. Okay. Le 1 est sur scène. Et je suis sur le 2. Le 2, micro 2. Micro 2, micro 2. Okay. Okay. Micro main 3. Le micro main 3. Ça devrait aller. Ça devrait aller. Et c'est du micro 3. Okay. Et c'est euh, okay. Test. Test. Est-ce que c'est bon Ok. Suite ok. Donc le 4, le 4, le 4. Ok. Le 4. Le 5, qui vient après le okay. 4, le 5. Le 6, le 6, okay. le 6. Le 7. Test, le test. Le numéro 7. Le 8. Ok. Le 9, le 9, le 9. Okay, okay. Et le 10 a été donné à Maud sur scène. D'accord, donc il est sur scène. Euh... Mais il n'y a pas de réseau. Ok. Bon, eh ben, écoute, ça a l'air stable pour le moment. Je fais un petit coup de toki avec ton mère. C'est bien la son, son propre micro ouais. qui s'entend dans les oreilles, c'est ça Ok. C'est pas le micro de l'idée. Ok, c'est résolu. Test, test, c'est bon. Là, c'est bon. C'est bon. 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 1, 2. Test, test. test.
Yes, salut, test, test. Test. Salut tout le monde, comment ça va aujourd'hui Merci à tous nos sponsors, China, Gestina, Accord, Choose Paris Région, Kiza Set Management, Metro Crawl du Grand Paris, Paris Co, Lab, Prologis, Union Investment, The Real Estate, qui vont nous accompagner aujourd'hui. Salut Arnaud, salut Arnaud, tu m'entends Oui Arnaud. Ouais, je t'entends bien. Ok, très bien. Juste Très rapidement, est-ce que c'est possible d'enlever un des logos qui est en dans, dans, dans le coin okay. en haut à droite Ok, on coupe.
aucun souci. Là. Normalement. Test, test. Voilà, Mortel. test. Test, test, là, est-ce que tu m'entends Un petit test, est-ce que vous entendez la voix de la traduction, de l'interprète 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. Non, je t'entends. Test, test, 1, 2, 3. Test, test voix interprète, est-ce que vous m'entendez 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. Test, test, oui, je pense que ça va. Là. Oui. Ouais. Sûr. One, two, three. Testing the English. Channel for interpreting one, two, three testing.
Je vais juste faire du bon ouais. Pas, Un, deux, trois. Petit test d'interprétation. Est-ce que vous entendez la voix anglaise? Uh, testing, testing sound. Can you hear me? One, two, three. Test. This is a sound check for the interpretation. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Testing sound. One, two, three. One, two, three. Testing sound. Two, three, testing, one, two, testing, English interpreting channel. Thank you.
Bonjour à tous. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, C'est un, un plaisir pour moi et un honneur de vous accompagner dans ce point d'orgue de notre Paris and Real Estate Week. Great pour honor ce forum de la ville. Paris Real uh, Estate Week dans un contexte to host a unique event in a very special environment. Uh, Many thanks to all of you for being uh, here with us at La Seine Musicale or remotely wherever you are in the world. In any case, this is a very powerful signal sent by the MIPIM teams when they decided to uh, continue uh, this event in a hybrid format. Of course, the sector of events uh, is well deserved to receive uh, this type of event, and then, of course, as you have done since the start of this week, it really feels good to be together. Remotely, uh, a very unique event, as I said in French, uh, to discuss, to share, to address all our challenges in this changing and uncertain period. Le décryptage, vous le disiez, uh, l'analyse de, de grands témoins, d'experts, et de nombreuses contributions autour de cette thématique qui est embracing the change. Je voudrais que vous remerciez toutes les équipes du MIPIM pour cette prouesse qui est à la fois technique. So I'd like to thank all the teams at MIPIM for this uh, remercier, uh, prowess. Le directeur. And uh, its uh, director, Ronan Vaspar. Very warm Vaspar. welcome to him. Ronan, qui est avec nous. Thanks for joining us. The floor is yours, Ronan. Thanks. Thank you. Bonjour à tous. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, dear members of the MIPIM community. So here we are at the MIPIM Urban Forum, which is part of the Paris Real Estate Week. Forgive me if I repeat this word. Paris, this great city, real estate, this great industry, and week, this opportunity after so many months to come together to start charting a way forward in a world that has changed so much. The challenges that we face today are not national, they are international. So we are honored and grateful that we have with us political leaders from France, Italy, Belgium, and Russia. Thank you for being with us today. Many of you are acquainted with MIPIM. It's a very large international event that takes place in Cannes every year in March. In 2020, this has not been possible. This has been disappointing for you, our clients, and disappointing for our partners in Cannes, of course. Many people have lost their businesses, Worse, people have lost members of their families. So while we are happy to come together, we also remember the human cost that people have paid over the past few months. The pandemic has changed the world. It has changed the cities in which we live. We'll have to think long and hard about how they will develop, not just to be sustainable, but also to be safe. We hope to contribute to this long and difficult debate today and in the months and years to come. Our town and cities are entering a new era, entering it in overdrive. The pandemic is changing the urban environment radically. Our working habits are changing. Even our lifestyle projects are being altered. We are being challenged over population density, the use of offices, mobility, how we design residential real estate or interact with the environment. These are questions that will not wait until tomorrow. They need to be dealt with today. So I want to thank everyone here, and particularly the partners and sponsors of the Paris Real Estate Week MIPIM. It's often said that every challenge presents an opportunity. The Paris Real Estate Week is a case in point. While we are attending the event today, I'm happy to tell you that people who couldn't come due to quarantine will be able to access today's content via live streaming. On top of that, speakers who couldn't travel but who were keen to participate will be speaking from their homes and offices. That's the first time that we have done this at MIPIM. So I would like to thank you all for being with us, political leaders, real estate stakeholders, innovators, but also students, the future talent of the real estate industry, and also more than 100 journalists. to notice and to mention now, you chose, you and your teams, to welcome a very special guest speaker to open this uh, session and this day. Yes, Frederick. MIPIM's commitment to you and to your colleagues at home is to bring you outstanding forward thinkers. Today we have such a person, 
former French President Nicolas Sarkozy. He served as the 23rd President of the French Republic from 27 to 2012. President Sarkozy guided France through the unique challenges of the 28 economic crises. He has shown time and again his commitment to a vision of the future, a future which is increasingly uncertain. In English, there is an expression that I think is particularly appropriate for President Sarkozy. He tells it how it is. No sugar, no walking around the subject, get to the point. So I'm sure we'll experience this today. Donc, mesdames et messieurs, c'est un immense honneur pour moi et pour l'ensemble de la communauté du MIPIM d'accueillir le président Nicolas Sarkozy. Please welcome on stage President Nicolas Sarkozy. Merci, mesdames, messieurs. Voilà, président Nicolas Sarkozy, qui nous rejoint, qui va être avec nous pendant une heure. Il s'installe. Voilà, peut-être une, une photo. Voilà. Merci, président, d'être d'être avec nous. Et Thank on va you, demander à, à François Langlais. Nous allons demander à François Langlais. Nous allons demander à François Langlais. French journalist François Langlais, spécialiste de l'économie, to come up on stage with us. François. Je vais vous donner mon micro, François. Voilà. Merci. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Nous sommes ici Greetings to all. We are gathered here today to listen to President Sarkozy. Making cities more humane is the topic of today uh, as urbanization is growing. There has been a very powerful movement of metropolization, concentration of capital, of human resources within cities. How far and how big can our cities grow? The pandemic and the fear of contagion, are they not something that are going to reverse, to buck the trend and make urban growth less powerful? Well, your first question encompasses at least 18 different questions. There are a number of global phenomena that are wholly unavoidable. The first one is the mutation. Uh, the global axis is now west-east. That no one can deny. Perhaps tomorrow the line will run from Africa, but today the axis of the world is tending towards the east rather than the west. And the metropolization of countries, the urbanization, is undeniably an important phenomenon. And nothing and no one can change that. Better still, if you look at Africa today, a continent of 1.25 billion inhabitants that will have 2.5 billion very soon, Africa today is 50 very large cities, more than 50 nations, because these metropolitan areas ignore ethnic divisions. And today, Dakar, Lagos, all of these huge cities, are phenomena with which, uh, to which we need to get used to. And further still, there will be no economic development in a nation if that nation does not have one or several metropolitan areas to drive the nation's economic train, so to speak. And final point, all of this COVID affair has nothing to do with that. COVID has no influence on phenomena that are that important. Life is much more important than circumstances. And life after COVID will look very much like life before it. And say that it won't be to uh, place humankind on a guilt trip 
means you do not understand what life on Earth is. Every time there's a crisis, everyone says nothing will ever be the same again. But when it ends, everything is, because life is more important than circumstances. So we're not going to ask you what an ideal city would be, but uh, you're familiar with the world. Which are the cities which you think could become role models? Well, that's uh, François Langlais' intelligence. He doesn't ask me what the ideal, ideal city would be, because, of course, there is no such thing. This uh, desire to create standards for happiness and ideal is quite the opposite of life itself. The ideal city changes from one continent, from one country, from one region to another. You must love cities, and you must love the differences between them. There is no one-size-fits-all. So if I were to make an effort to focus, I thought I would say there is something that absolutely must be avoided, that is trying to choose between identity and modernity. A city must be both loyal to its past and open to its future. The ideal city must live. Life itself emerged on Earth 4.5 billion years ago in multiple forms, and it's the multiplicity and difference and diversity that creates the quality of life and happiness of being alive. And I'm highly skeptical of the word, of the word equality, because I will always believe the strength of difference is greater than the egalitarian lie, which is a desire to flatten out things. True equality is letting differences express themselves. It completely absurd to try to treat everyone in the same manner. I know that it's an old French reflex, but equality itself does not exist. Look at healthcare, for instance. There is no right to health. Everyone's health heritage is different. It depends on the biological lottery, of course. You are entitled to health care, of course, but where is equality? You must love cities, as I was saying. But you must love all of the differences within a city, because a wonderful city cannot look like another wonderful city. It needs to adapt to its own territory, its history, its culture, its demographics. And that is what makes it beautiful and vibrant. There is not a single model. What cities do you enjoy visiting apart from ours? If I were to think about one of the cities that uh, amazed me the most in its, with its ability to change, I would say Moscow. I visit Moscow two, three times a year and have done so for a number of years. And for those of you who are familiar with Russia and who visited Moscow, I am impressed by the manner in which Moscow has succeeded in retaining its historical heritage and become one of the most modern cities in the European continent. That is outstanding, and I'm not just talking about the new metro. They were a little bit quicker than we were. Than we were. So I'm not making a judgment here, it's just a, out of personal taste, but on the Persian Gulf, by which I mean what's on the other side of Iran, the cities that they have created are absolutely flabbergasted. I'm flabbergasted. Look at Doha, Abu Dhabi, where at the moment they have four museum projects underway. Four. The Louvre Abu Dhabi is a huge success. Dubai. Imagine, picture this, three generations ago, their grandfathers lived in the desert under a tent. And today, 
architecture is thriving. And they've even uh, made Hong Kong look outdated. It's most impressive. But then when you visit places like Lagos, 22 million people live there. Ten times Paris. Ten times more than Paris. If you look at Mexico City, uh, which is always threatened by earthquakes, one of the largest cities in the world, and Beijing, they have uh, now built a seventh ring road. So I know that the French poet Prévert used to say Paris is great because it is small, but that is what the cities of tomorrow look like. And what I like are cities that are in motion, cities that are daring, cities that make infrastructures, cities where architecture thrives, where cities where you're not paralyzed by regulation, rules, where you prefer to make an ugly, legal, an ugly cube because it's legal rather than uh, something uh, more vibrant. And uh, if uh, they were to build the Eiffel Tower, the uh, charity that defends uh, blue-spotted frogs would say, no, you can't. I think a city must live, must be alive, and it's only alive through the quality of the architecture you allow there. Uh, Mr. President, you have just talked about regulation. The latest municipal elections in France uh, have voted in a, a large number of, uh, of green mayors. What do you see there? Ah, it means uh, huge progress, doesn't it? What cities of the future do you think that can prepare? Look, I am here in the uh, region of the Hauts-de-Seine. Um, I was president of this region in the heart of uh, the greater Paris. There was nothing here on this island, nothing. Absolutely nothing at all. And there was an idea. We wanted to do things. That is what I mean by a city in motion. You know, I like uh, cycling, I like the Tour de France, it's a, a free to watch, admirable people, an admirable sport. I would never have imagined that these people would be under attack, that they would be despised, that they would be treated of, uh, they would be called polluters and machos. That is regression. When I was a kid, I used to go with my mother. I used to wait for the whole year. And uh, we went out to shop to buy our Christmas tree. That was hugely important for me, the symbol, the culture, the respect for a tradition, family values. I didn't feel I was a criminal harming humankind. But, you know, you need to adapt to the times. <laughs> ah, it feels good not to be a politician, I can say. That is pure politics. But it's quite the opposite of what I have always believed in. A country, a city, is a long history. It, it's part of a culture. You've been bathed by myths, symbols, beliefs, books, music, film. What are we talking about? It's the total denial of our deeper nature. What do you think that says about French society? I think it expresses a kind of vacuum. How do you think we can move towards the future if we renege on our roots. How can we build something strong and modern and new with true content if we turn our back on originality, on the originality and history of our country? So uh, there were the nativity scenes that made them mad. Now it's the Christmas trees. Where will they stop? So, of course, environmental concerns are crucial. I very much understand. And I won't take any lessons from anyone. 
J'ai voulu le Grenelle de l'environnement. I chose uh, the Grenelle de l'environnement uh, should be organized, the Copenhagen Accord. But it can't be a refusal of any form of progress. It cannot be this kind of a single thought where everyone can just uh, want to have a, a detached house in a peri-urban area. It's uh, not something absurd as being for or against skyscrapers or against 5G mobile networks. Yeah, against all that. I say, are you for or against skyscrapers, high-rise buildings? I say, I'm against ugly ones and I'm for uh, beautiful ones. I may not be very smart, but I know what I'm saying when I say that. And then people say, ah, densification of cities, but François Langlais, densification. When you're in Manhattan, do you say Manhattan's too densely urbanized? You say, no, it's beautiful. Defense. La défense, rather. I had to walk through Nanterre when La Défense didn't exist. Was it better? Really? Along the Seine River. I think it would be great if there could be bridges with ha homes on them, uh, like uh, they were in the Middle Ages. You don't need to see uh, the Rialto Bridge to know that that was the case. You mustn't look at the future in the hatred of everything that makes sense, anything that's a little bit powerful, of course. Everyone can't just live in their little cube. When Pompidou decided to create the Pompidou Center, so of course, I mean, you can like it or not like it, but they are powerful statements. When Mitterrand wanted to build Pays Pyramid, uh, it was highly controversial, which is a healthy thing. But these are concepts uh, built that can't be built on void. It wasn't really your question, but it definitely was my answer. Mr. Sarkozy, Mr. Sarkozy, France. France was very much marked. There, there were a few. No. La fracture territoriale, c'est une réalité. No. Um, territorial uh, divide is a reality, and I think we have to do whatever we can to uh, reduce it. I think that the uh, metropolization is unavoidable. You know, the, 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 the crisis, and again, I consider myself to be an outsider of the political debate, but I disagree with the idea that this is a social crisis. This is a crisis which has to do with the labor world. Look at what happened during the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, we've had different uh, initiatives, uh, partial unemployment, and uh, the, uh, the government accepted to pay the salaries of all those who were uh, under lockdown, those who could not work. I think France is the only country uh, that did it to this extent, right? The, the country accepted to nationalize salaries for three months. And I'm not criticizing because I, I, I as a matter of fact, agree with this. Studies are free in France. And our health care system is unparalleled. Health itself is free. And now we have a social crisis. What do we want? Do we want more benefits? As if we didn't already have enough. This is not where, where the crisis is. We have a crisis with those who work hard all day long, and yet who can't pay their bills at the end of the month. The crisis comes from people who work hard, who cannot work more, and who, at the end of the month, 
have nothing left. This is a concern, and this should be a concern. And this is, uh, this is what I said back in 2007. And once again, we have to value and recognize work, hard work. During three months, we were forced to work either less or differently. And I think it is perfectly acceptable to see how we can make up for this time, which was lost. The countries that will win the 21st century battle uh, are the countries where labor will be properly rewarded and, and encouraged. The countries that, challenge, that, are, that, that are challenged are the countries where people don't work enough. I have a question. Thank you very much for applauding. Uh, this is very kind of you. Uh, but if, if you, uh, if, if you're happy at the end, um, <laughs> it's okay to tell me at the end. You don't, don't, don't feel like you have to applaud. Internationally speaking, Mr. President, we have the the multilateral system, which is, seems to be falling apart, or disarticulating. Climate change, uh, demographic sprawl. You've been the initiator of uh, a number of the 2000 of, of the response to the 2008 crisis. Are you concerned about this disarticulation? And if yes, how how shall it be fixed? Well, let let's look at things from a very simple vantage point. Which international organizations have uh, have not been impacted by the crisis? I think there's only one. Is it Europe? No. I think it's central banks. I, I beg your pardon, Mr. Langley. We've had lockdowns at different periods, and the rules that applied were not the same. If that is Europe, well, I, I, I don't think that's the way Europe should operate. Central banks, however, did their job. They played a central role, and nobody is challenging what they did. WHO was literally pulverized. It's almost ridiculous. The International Monetary Fund, some people seem to even have forgotten their name. The International Monetary Fund is supposed to play an important role in the global economy. Have you ha heard one single word from the International Monetary Fund during the crisis? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. It doesn't make me regret Dominic Strauss-Kahn, but, but, but I think they could have done a little better. Who knows who is chairing the IMF these days? When we, the U.S., were nowhere to be found, and the G20, in spite of the goodwill of a number of countries, there, I, I understand that Skype meetings are difficult, but the fact is that they made no concrete decisions either. The bottom line is we're in 2020, we've entered the 21st century, and we have, uh, we're, and, and, and the, the institutional, the, the international organizations are those we had in the 20th century. We need to build a new system, a new system which will allow multilateralism to function. Take the United Nations and the uh, Security Council. The members were chosen when the world had a little under 2 billion inhabitants. Today there are s nearly 7 billion inhabitants. So is it normal to have the number, the same number of countries that are members? That are members? No, it's not. there is not a single African country. India, which is the highest populated country, is not represented. There is not a single Latin American country. It makes no sense. There is not a single Arabic country which is a permanent member. This makes no sense. Uh, uh, um, Europe, well, if you ask me, I'll tell you what I think. Uh, but I think we have to completely revisit uh, the world's governance completely. It needs to be completely revisited to meet the requirements of our challenge. We have institutions that are a century old, for some, that were created in the past century, and we're in the new century. 
I hear what you're saying, Mr. President, uh, about the, the lockdown and how people responded to uh, COVID-19. There is something quite spectacular, however. It's uh, the new pro the, the, the economic support programs, uh, Mrs. Merkel, the, the, the central banks. When we look back, uh, and consider what happened in 2008 and then 2009 and during the euro crisis, uh, the response this time came much faster, right? Well, we can speak again uh, about what happened back in 2008, 2009, and even 2010. I, I, I'm, I'm perfectly happy uh, to, to, to discuss this. Uh, however, I, I cannot accept the, 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 the fact that the second economy of Europe, uh, that's the UK, leave Europe without this being a, a scandal. There are business leaders in this room. Imagine that all of a sudden you, your company's main subsidiary decides to leave. You would fight to keep it. It's a disaster for the Brits. It's a disaster for us. Europe cannot operate for the next 70 years, the same way it operated the, during the past 70 years. It is not possible. We're at 27 without the Brits, and it's a disaster. The fact that they're leaving, that is, is a disaster. In the future, we're probably going to be 32 or 36. I, I don't see how we can tell the Balkan countries who are not members to stay out. We have to completely revisit uh, Europe, and we need to consider that Europe na in the future it means there are several forms of Europe. There's a Euro Europe, there is the uh, Union of Europe, we need the Schengen Europe, which is to be uh, led by a government com comprised of the ministers of uh, interior. And it, 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 they need to report to Frontex because the immigration and border control policies has have to be managed by an institution which itself is political to be fully legitimate. And this has to be supervised by France and Germany. Um, I'm, I'm still wondering when we're going to see the money, the money from the, from the support programs. Procedures are extremely long, um, and the, the notion that all countries have the same rights or the same duties is, is inaccurate. When the crisis, when the cri when crises come, big countries have more responsibility than small countries. People don't turn to Luxembourg, Malta. People talk to Germany and France, right? And I very much support Mr. Macron's and Mrs. Merkel's uh, initiatives. I think we need to revisit Europe. Once again, the European project. Being a European these days means supporting movement and, and not being in favor of immobilism. I, I will just wrap up by saying that the Brexit is a British problem, but it's not just a British problem. It is a European problem. If we'd asked the same question to all European countries, I think we would have the same answer across the board, including in France, when Mr. Chirac held a referendum in 2005, 55% uh, of the people said no. So I think we need to revisit Europe. A crisis is always an opportunity to change and reform countries or institutions. And during a crisis, there are always people who are completely paralyzed by fear. And they're afraid of movement, therefore. The difference between the 2008, 2010, and COVID-19 crisis uh, is that with COVID-19, even though it's very serious, we know it's why things are not working. Because there's a virus, right? First of all, we have to understand why all of a sudden confidence disappeared. If you suppress COVID, not easy. But we're back on track. Back in 2008 or 2009, I wish we could have pressed a button to suppress something to put things back on track, but it wasn't that easy. One question uh, slightly outside of Europe, uh, Turkey. You were the first and only one who refused the, to even consider the integration of Turkey in Europe. Uh, history is uh, showing you were right with the unbelievable increase of tension between uh, Europe and, uh, and Turkey, and, and, and more specifically, uh, Turkey and France. 
How do you, how, what do you, what, what, what's your take on this crisis and on the situation with uh, Turkey? Well, w when, I, when I went to Ankara, uh, yeah, right, you said this in your book, I said I would never accept Turkey uh, in the EU, never, ever. I was back then accused of being uh, Islamophobic, uh, Turkophobic. Mr. Chirac uh, said you have to be uh, stupid to not understand uh, why it is important to have Turkey in, in, in Europe. I took it a little personally, um, and I did understand it was not a compliment. But I thought that there were more, more fools, um, which in a sense was a consolation. And as a matter of fact, Mr. Chirac, François Hollande and the Socialist, Socialist Party were absolutely convinced that Erdogan should have had a, should have a seat around the, the, the Europe, European table. Some people say, well, right, but if, if Turkey were part of Europe, they would behave differently. Yeah, right. Well, look at what they've done with NATO. They're part of NATO. And therefore, there is no more NATO. Turkey has no business being in Europe because it's not a European country. And to my knowledge, the borders of Europe are not in Iraq and Syria. However, I think we need to have talks with Turkey. My, create, my, my suggestion is to create a completely new European body with three founding members, Europe, Russia, and Turkey, above Europe. And in the future, we could probably attach other countries like the Ukraine, Georgia, or even Belarusia. I see two important topics that need to be addressed, e economic questions and safety-related questions. And that is how the problem should be addressed, I believe. For the rest, Mr. Er Erdogan is getting upset. I, I can understand why. Back in 1994, he's the former mayor of Istanbul. He lost Istanbul. Uh, I, I guess his party lost Istanbul. So he got upset and is now taking advantage of COVID-19 to um, play a more important role in the Mediterranean region. Uh, he, some say that the, 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 the gas potential is bigger than in that region is, is bigger than the one in, in, in Norway. I approve Mr. Macron's policy. Uh, Mr. Macron decided to disagree with uh, to oppose Turkey. And uh, he asked uh, Turkey to stick to international rules and regulations. Do you approve uh, the fact that troops were sent to the region? I approve a firm uh, position with respect to Mr. Er Erdogan. I created the Union for, for the Mediterranean. My successor uh, found a way to destroy it. I'm, I'm not talking about Mr. Macron. I'm talking about the other one. I think I understood, says François Langlais. When you turn your back to the Mediterranean, it's like turning your back to the past. But I think we also turn our back to the future. And again, we ought to have the Union for the Mediterranean, to have a, a Pacific dialogue, including different topics like Turkey uh, and, and Greece. It's not a new topic, but it's essential. But there again, we need to be creative. Turkey doesn't have a seat, doesn't have a place, doesn't have its place in Europe. Therefore, let's create this new organization above Europe, which would be a body where, where we can sit, sit and talk and hopefully resolve conflicts. OK, let's travel a little further to a country that you like, that you cherish, the US. Uh, they have upcoming elections. What is your prognosis? Uh, what are your personal wishes? Uh, this dem democracy is being agitated by turbulent forces. 
Well, I think that the uh, Atlantic uh, access is absolutely essential for us. Uh, let me say that first. Since the independence of uh, the United States of America, they and, and, and we have, have, have lived the same cultures and, and, and have similar civilizations. And putting an end to the, uh, trans, to, to the Atl Atlantic uh, axis would be a problem. We managed to uh, go from the 20th century to the 21st century successfully because we had the uh, Atlantic access. My fear is that if we don't have this access, the, the, the future wouldn't look very good, wouldn't look very bright. So this is very important, preserving the Atlantic axis. We need to, uh, the second thing I would like to say is uh, we need to, you, you, you love a country for what it is, not for who, who leads it. I've, I've seen the period of Barack Obama where Barack Obama was walking on water and where people said you have to love America because it is Barack Obama. Uh, I uh, remember uh, George W. Bush who was hated by the world. Everybody was supposed to hate America because it was Bush. That has no sense. The U.S. has 400 million inhabitants. It's a culture, the American culture. They, we share the same history to a, a large extent. And this has nothing to do with whether we like the uh, president uh, of, uh, of the United States or not. This is a detail. Mr. Trump is not the cause of America's decadence. He is the symptom of America's decadence. He is not the one who created the decadence of America, but he is simply showing that this decadence is there. Nobody else could wish to have someone like Trump managing their country, right? So what is going to happen? Well, what will happen is what Americans decide. They will decide for themselves. I have to tell you that Bolsonaro, Trump, Johnson are not people I would have liked to do business with. I can say that. That's the truth. But I don't decide. It's not up to me to decide. You don't decide, as a matter of fact. I think what we need is Atlantic solidarity, mutual support. That's the book. Trump is just the newspaper. See the difference? We have history on one side. The other side, we have the breaking news or latest news. Um, you've always been very indulgent with me, and your indulgence has always touched me, Mr. Langley. Um, Mr. Uh, President, let's stay in the U.S. Uh, and, and, and a bit closer to the Pacific. With COVID-19, there's been increased tensions between China and the U.S. It's not three months old. It's more than three months old. And the election of uh, Donald Trump has uh, accelerated tensions. Some call it the new Cold War. What's the role of Europe in this new Cold War? And more specifically, what's the role of France in, in this new Cold War? Some people say we have to align with the U.S. position, um, but there, there is a, there a risk of, 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 of increased distance with China. Others are saying maybe we should align with China because, uh, because of Donald Trump. Donald Trump's uh, position with respect to the transatlantic treaty. Well, let me say this. The first military power, the first economic power, the first monetary power in the world is the U.S. Since three terms now, they have repeatedly refused to exert their international duties. Barack Obama, my friend, my friend, was much more friendly and more uh, open uh, than Mr. Trump. But, but there is a there is a there is a but. America has. I, I think. 
I think that the, um, uh, the, the withdrawal, the, 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 the gradual withdrawal of America started with, um, with, with, with Mr. Obama. Uh, look at facts. Take Mr. Bush. Bush thought that American values could apply everywhere, he, and he thought this way too much. Barack Obama had one single objective. He wanted to be loved by the world and, and bring Americans back home by doing so. Trump is Trump. Let's not be cruel. For the first time, the, 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 the the leading spot the, the, the is available. Uh, and as it is available, we're seeing the rise of China. For the very first time in the history of China, China has never been more comfortable with its um, will to politically conquer the rest of the world. They're absolutely comfortable with this notion of conquering the world. When they created the wall, the Great Wall of China, it was to protect themselves from um, barbarians, including ourselves, who are coming from the outside world. They call themselves l'Empire du Milieu. Um, their only obsession uh, was to recuperate uh, Macau, Taiwan, possibly Tibet. But never, ever has a Chinese leader uh, publicly uh, said we're going to build the Silk Road. I, and let me just remind you that the Silk Road stops in Scotland on the western end. This is the most fantastic uh, expansionist, um, decomplexed project we've ever seen in the history of China. The Chinese very smartly understood that America was giving up the first seat, the seat of leadership, and they're saying, well, it's available, let us take it. And that's exactly what we're seeing. We can't tell them wrong. Would, would we not have done the same thing with the um, a driving seat being empty? Barack Obama was coming from um, the Pacific side. And you know, there, there, are, there are positive sides to this story. I think we should encourage China to become a global partner and play its role to reduce uh, GHG emissions, reduce uh, local, uh, regional conflicts, to contribute to uh, monetary stability. Remember when Clinton asked to include yuan uh, amongst the most important world currencies. And there, there, there are a lot of positive aspects. The problem is there is a lack of counterparties. Uh, Europe, uh, India, sorry, India uh, hasn't reached the, uh, the right level of economic development. And that's where we ha Europe has a key role to play. Strategically, Europe should play its role. But in, in order for Europe to play its role indeed, our European democracies have to stop considering that leadership by definition is illegitimate. You can't, there is nothing you can do without a powerful leader. Everybody talks about the horizontality. I only believe in verticality. I know that it doesn't sound very fashionable or trendy to say so. Well, that's the way it is. Europe has a key role to play, but Europe needs a leader. Europe needs a strategy, and Europe needs a policy. When, when it was decided to convince uh, Putin to move out of Georgia, 
it happened because of Europe, because Europe took the initiative, and France did. Well, I was I was chairing Europe, and I decided to um, do without the rules, because European rules are designed for you to do nothing, right? And uh, I guess that has been that has worked out quite well, because little is happening. You know, when you see how much time it requires to get everyone's opinion, the country you need to save has, has been invaded twice, uh, if not more, uh, and um, it, it just doesn't work. So once again, I am pleading in favor of Franco-German leadership and European leadership. But again, uh, Europe has yet to understand that democracy is not. That, 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 that Europe needs to be given the tools and, and, and freedom. You're in real estate, right? You're, you're real estate professionals. You, you, it's, it's exactly the same thing for you. I think the current situation is, is representing huge opportunities. Let us come back to France. In France, we are seeing uh, an unprecedented economic crisis. How do you see the coming uh, months in France uh, from an economic standpoint? Tough question. Um, I think it very much depends on what area or what, what um, industries we're talking about. I think that the crisis in tourism and travel is going to last longer than expected. I think that in um, uh, the impact on airlines and uh, the aerospace industry is going to be is going to last longer uh, than expected. My my worries and my concern is that is how are we going to put an end to uh, the decadence of the Western world? Well, I think we need great projects. We need love for great projects. Our country has to innovate. Our country has to build infrastructures. I wanted the greater Paris, but we need more than the greater Paris. We need the greater Lyon. We need the greater Marseille to make it the, the cultural capital of the Mediterranean. We should have a TGV going from Le Havre to Paris, because Le Havre is part of the greater Paris, because that Le Havre is the port of Paris. We should have a canal going from uh, from the, the, the Seine Nord Canal. This would be a great way for the Picardy region and, uh, and, and, and the northern region to be connected. We should have high-speed train lines uh, all the way to Brest, not just Rennes. We should have the Lyon-Torino high-speed train line. So that's how you um, – what we need to put an end to the crisis is initiatives. Uh, that's how you put an end to French depression. We need larger projects, greater than ourselves. France is designed for great projects, and France cannot uh, accept small projects. We need large projects, ambitious projects, and that is how you wake up people. That is how you wake up the economy. The, the, the president is not responsible for unemployment, for, for jobs, or how or, or how well companies do. The president is responsible for boosting people's morale, the, the morale of the nation, and the morale goes up when we have large projects. When we have, when we had uh, this the crisis, I, I decided to go for the loan, the big loan, right? And some people told me you're crazy. The amount of, of debt has is absolutely irrelevant. What is really important is what does what purpose does the uh, the debt serve the, we, what happened is over the look back over the past 10 years mo money has a ne has a neg negative value these days you can no longer have the same e uh, economic strategy when money has a negative value as opposed to when money has positive value you know we used to borrow money for 70 percent this is what my mother paid to her bank when she bought her first apartment okay 70% credit. What What is important is not the debt. It's how you use the debt. If you can use your debt to pay for infrastructure, infrastructure that will be bring growth for the future, that will generate income to pay back, then it's okay. Then it is perfectly okay. If you use the debt to keep people quiet, to tame social unrest, 
If you just use it to give people more purchasing power, well, then eventually you're going to hit a brick wall. So my message is take initiatives, invest in museums, invest in large events, invest in infrastructure, invest in architectural pro programs and projects that will make the French proud of their country. That's what I think uh, the future should hold for us. And that is how you can address the existential crisis the French are going through. No, not, only the, not, not only the French, but Europeans and, and the Western world, more generally speaking. I think we need to mobilize energy. Uh, so some people say there is no money. That is not true. That's a mistake. I think projects generate money. It's not money that generates projects. And I'm perfectly prepared to explain that in more detail, because if you wait until you have money to conduct large projects, you'll never do them. Louis XIV, when he built Versailles, was accused of ruining France. You think it's uh, been amortized now? You think it's paid itself back? I would say so. Word of conclusion, Mr. President something you are deeply committed to, the uh, September Nord campaign. Yes, thanks for giving me this opportunity. I'm, I'm a passionate man, although I've withdrawn from politics. Politics was part of my life. It no longer is. But I was deeply moved by someone I met, Noé Lemos, a kid, I met him when he was eight, and who died three and a half years later from a terrible form of cancer. Noé, unfortunately, had a brain tumor. Let me tell you something. Kids who have that type of tumor, their chances of survival, zero. 100% of the kids die. I supported Noé and his wonderful family throughout uh, this uh, ordeal, and I thought that I did not have any other choice but to participate in the struggle against cancer in children. Of course, cancer in adults is a, is a dreadful thing, but cancer in kids is a very different thing. It's even more unfair. You can't say that it's behavioral for them at all. And in Villejuif Hospital, where these wonderful teams are struggling to save these kids, uh, I found it very difficult to go there because I was afraid. I thought I was going to look death in the face, but what I saw was life. People who had given up everything to save their kids. I saw young kids who'd already been operated on 15 times. And I decided to work with Frédéric Lemos to raise funds, because every year, 2,500 children, you're there, you're with your kid, your son, your daughter, you go to the doctor, and the doctor says, I'm sorry, your child has cancer. And it takes money to push back the disease, which is why I decided to make a commitment in the struggle against pediatric cancer and everything one can do, give money. We have a project with Frédéric Lemos that's uh, fantastic. We've collected funds already, but we want to build uh, a building in Villejuif Hospital purely dedicated to saving these kids. So I know it's not a very happy thing I'm talking about, but let me tell you something that I felt very deeply. If you give funds in research in pediatric cancer, you'll do a good deed, but you'll also make your own self feel good. Because when you defend a noble cause, it does good to yourself. It feels good. You're not alone. You call uh, for solidarity. And look at these poor kids, these poor families. It can happen to any one of us. Of course, uh, I don't wish it. I wouldn't wish it to anyone. But to them, to these families, it feels really good to know that there is support. 
So through that, we flew over a team from the US, we're moving forward, and uh, it's something I feel very enthusiastic. It's my only charitable commitment, because I want to dedicate as much of my energy as I can. What I'm interested in today, I, I've been such a, I've been a very lucky person in life, and I need to help people who need that. I have, it's a duty, and these kids need help. Thank you, Mr. Longo. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I would like to thank President Nicolas Sarkozy and journalist François Langlais for this uh, presentation. Mr. President, you were talking about the Gustave Roussy Foundation and Septembre Honneur. There is a booth outside this room, and you can go and meet the people who work for this charity. Nicolas Sarkozy's book is here, and the President will be signing it outside. Le Temps des Tempêtes, already a bestseller. A lot of interesting things, vision, shared ambition, national pride, and uh, geopolitics. Thank you very much, Mr. President. It was a great honor for us. Thank you. Thank you, François. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, let's continue with this uh, Forum de la Ville, a unique event. Many thanks for you, whether you're here physically or remotely. Host this unique event, unique because uh, inspiring, uh, with big ideas, uh, sharing real life examples and tips and tools for action. Uh, don't forget to switch your mobile phone on vibrate, please. Uh, social media, you can uh, share your experience with your network. Uh, the hashtag is uh, MIPIM, at MIPIM World, and it's an interactive uh, forum, so don't forget to prepare and ask questions and to, uh, to take part to the discussions. Uh, feel free to use the Slido appli. Uh, it's uh, easy to ask questions, and I will be, uh, I will be the, the one to, uh, to explain uh, your, your questions. So um, we're going to um, begin a, a new session, COVID-19 and trends to watch. The period has been uh, uh, particularly uh, important as, uh, as we have faced tremendous collapse, uh, but it's also a fantastic opportunity for us. What are the key issues? What are the challenges we have to, to face and to solve uh, as far as demographic trends, future urbanization policies, mobility are concerned? Uh, COVID-19 and trends to watch. It's now. And now we can have a jingle. This is the first session, this is the first debate, COVID-19 entrance to watch. The purpose is to analyze the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the global framework, thanks to uh, the expertise and the knowledge of our experts. Uh, please welcome Anne Seneke. Anne is our moderator. Anne is a medical doctor and co-director of Global Health Think Tank at IRIS, l'Institut des Relations Internationales et Stratégiques, and Albert Mej. You are CEO of Presence. Thanks for joining us today. And we are on remote with Dr. Olga Schmindling, Chief Economist at Berengberg. Different angles, uh, different consequences uh, on this global health crisis, scientific, sociologic, economic, how to better prepare another epidemic pandemic if it happens. And you can see it, and the floor is yours right now. Voilà, je vous laisse le, le micro. COVID-19, les tendances à, à regarder et, et surtout à analyser. On va en parler. Je vais demander à nos amis en régie de faire démarrer le chrono. OK, so minutes. if our people, Merci à vous. if our technicians you, could now you. start the so countdown. So the COVID-19 and trend to watch. We will uh, explore how COVID-19 already changed our world. Sorry about... Uh, uh, to not be agree with uh, President Sarkozy. I think COVID-19 changed our world. And we will explore this with uh, Monsieur Albert Mage, 
which is a consulting company at Crossroad at strategy and expertise in science and technology. And in remote, Dr. Olger Schmeckding, chef economist from Berenberg Bank in, in Germany. So he should be with us uh, on remote. And um, as Frederick said, I'm Dr. Senekia, I'm a medical doctor, and uh, I'm working on uh, health uh, situation, uh, environment, and uh, urban setting. So, at the end, and we will have time for a few questions, so if you want to, you can uh, send uh, the question to, uh, to the app. So, I was asking what will we rem remember from the global health crisis? I think for sure what we will remember is that global health crisis is still possible. We had some pandemic already in what we call Western world. We remember the, the plague far long ago, but the flu also in 1980. But then we believe that epidemic was not for us anymore. It was kind of history. And it was more for the other part of the world. And we had Ebola, we had SARS, we had Zika and Chikungunya to maintain us in, in this belief. We thought our health system was too good to be overwhelmed, too good to be worried. And then the COVID-19 hit us hard, sharp, and especially without border. We lose our peers, we lose our senior, but we, will, we also lose our ego and uh, our pride. Maybe it's a good thing because like this, we will be fresh, and humble enough to be able to think of the world of tomorrow. Tomorrow, for sure, will be urban. To be true, today is already urban. 4.5 billion people are living in urban setting area, and we noticed the last couple of years that cities are not the place to be for a human being in age of climate change and pandemic, especially when you need to deal with this double burden like we are now. 8,000 years ago, humankind started gathering in order to be in the city, in order to be safe, in order for, for solidarity, exchange, trade. And I feel now we completely lost this concept of urban setting. And this health crisis shows us that cities do not fit what humankind needs. We need clean, health, safe, smart, green city, and wealthy city. And for this, I, I will ask to Dr. Olger Schmeding to, show, to, part, to share his point of view on what to expect for the world economy uh, in uh, post-COVID uh, situation. Olger. Thank you very much. Well, in the economic sphere, we also had a very, very nasty shock. When we were ordered to stay at home, when shops and factories had to be closed, that was the worst drop in output that we've seen in peacetime. But we are now well on track for an economic recovery across the advanced world. We call it a tick-shaped recovery. Tick meaning after a huge fall down, it goes up initially fairly fast and then flattens out over time. We are seeing that. The first stage of the rebound was that retail sales of goods rose again to year-ago levels. That is, people online and in the shops bought again. That was the first few months of the rebound. Now we are in a second stage where the production and international trade in goods is starting to rise noticeably again, trying to catch up with the almost normal sales of goods. We will next year have further reasons to hope for an ongoing economic recovery that is, next year, we should expect some rebound of business investment. We should expect next year that the fiscal programs, which are beyond survival support, that the programs for more government spending on investment, that they will come to fruit. And as a result, we do expect the advanced world to reach its pre-pandemic level of economic activity roughly two years after the Trump, with the US, Germany, France probably being back to pre-pandemic activity in early 2022, Italy and Brexit straight in UK more like a year later. But we have serious differences between sectors. And on a longer term view, this pandemic is accentuating and accelerating trends 
which were already there before. For instance, we were already seeing a bit of hesitancy in globalization and trade for goods. We were already seeing some moves to move away from too much reliance on China. This will now be accentuated as we restructure in goods trade our supply chains, bring them to some extent closer to home, have another second, a spare supplier, just in case. We are moving a bit from the focus on just efficiency on having a safe, a secure supply. We also see under the pressure of crisis, which does shake up ingrained habits, that we are going for a faster dispersion of new, of top-notch, of digital technologies. So we are actually making technological progress in the sense that more people, including me using this remote technology now, are working with new, top-notch technologies. That is ultimately good, that we have a better choice of working from home, of traveling, or business of working from the office. And one other trend that we will likely see <clears throat> is we will likely see more government intervention, strategic and for social policy reasons, into the economy than we had before. So the pandemic has shaken up ingrained habits. It is accentuating trends that were visible before. As to the overall level of economic activity, after two years, we should be back to where we were before the virus. Thank you. Thank you. Olga, could you tell us about the indicator of the crisis we are witnessing for the next few months, maybe? Well, the first thing I'm, of course, always watching still every morning is the trends in the pandemic, in the virus, where I'm especially watching whether the rise in infection that we are seeing is starting to lead to an overwhelming of health systems, which could force us into harsher lockdowns. So far, by and large, that's not the case. The other thing I'm watching is confidence, business and household confidence. If the rebound in confidence that we are seeing will continue, then I can be more certain that next year, with more confidence, we will see more spending and investment. So getting the virus under control and keeping confidence on an uptrend is key. Thank you, Ogla. Albert, could you tell us about the trend you usually uh, see on, uh, on this situation right now? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here with you guys. And uh, I would like to thank you, the people who stayed with us and did not uh, rush uh, just after uh, President Nicolas Sarkozy. Um, so maybe just a few words about myself, uh, just so you understand where uh, these uh, trends that I'm going to speak about are, are actually coming from. So as you can see on the photo behind, I am the, uh, the founder and CEO of a company called Présence, which is a, a strategy consulting company at the crossroad of, uh, exp of yeah, strategy and expertise in science and technology. This is one of my hats. And I have a second hat also. I am a professor at uh, HEC uh, Business School, uh, where I teach uh, mostly innovation and digital transformation. And uh, due to these two activities, I am uh, leading a circle of uh, executives uh, where we have uh, about 15 large uh, companies uh, ranging from the, for example, agri-food. We have uh, companies such as uh, uh, Danone, Bonduel, etc., all the way to uh, car industry with companies such as uh, Renault, Valeo, a few others, we have uh, players from the defense sector also, such as uh, Thales, uh, from the energy sector, from the environment sector, etc. So this circle is composed of uh, executives, uh, so typically people who are uh, either at the executive committee level or uh, just uh, reporting to the executive uh, committee level. Anyway, um, with this circle, we have uh, regular afterworks, like once, once per month, typically. And uh, we have increased the uh, frequency of these uh, uh, gathering of these uh, afterworks, and now it takes place, of course, in, uh, in uh, the virtual world. Uh, and we increase the frequency of this gathering to have more uh, news uh, from the battlefront, what is going on in all these industries and on, uh, uh, in these companies. And so what I would like to share with you are uh, just a few points that have been shared over the last few weeks uh, from these companies. 
Um, so the first one, uh, obviously, is related to, uh, to home. Uh, as uh, we have all noticed, uh, our uh, places, our home, uh, came back at the heart of our lives, uh, both from a, a personal uh, standpoint, but also from a prof professional standpoint. Um, and this is associated to a number of trends. For, uh, for example, uh, there has been a, a very strong acceleration of uh, online shopping. I guess uh, you have all uh, experienced that. Online shopping and also uh, local consume, uh, consumption, uh, like local shops or, or products coming uh, much closer from uh, where, uh, where you live. And these trends related to uh, home coming back to the heart of our lives uh, have created a number of uh, expectations. And it seems that these expect expectations are going to last in the long term. Uh, for example, uh, now uh, people, especially in, in large cities, uh, tend to be a lot more, uh, to pay more attention to the time they spend uh, in, uh, in transport. Like uh, we have realized that we were spending uh, between 30 minutes and one hour every day uh, uh, going to work back and forth. Uh, so this is one thing, uh, decrease expectation regarding the time we spend in transport. Um, the, um, uh, also the fact that we have uh, far less cars uh, in towns, it has decreased uh, to some extent uh, pollution, it, it, it increased also uh, uh, the space that we have uh, when we walk or we run in towns. And uh, also, there is uh, still related to that, uh, the fear of public transport. And there is something which is quite interesting that uh, we have noticed in this uh, circle of companies. Um, although uh, there is some kind of fear of uh, public transport, it has affected um, in different ways. If you take trains, for example, uh, people who used to take planes uh, to go from uh, cities to cities are no now tend to use more trains. So intercities, uh, people tend to use more trains, while, while uh, inside the cities, uh, people tend to uh, move towards uh, bikes or scooters, these kind of things, uh, instead of, uh, of trains. So this, this was uh, the first trend related to, uh, to, uh, to home that I wanted to, uh, to share with you. Uh, the second trend uh, is related to what Olga was uh, speaking about just before. It's the shape of the um, uh, economical uh, recovery. Uh, and I think there are th three levels. Uh, there is the level of the, the country, of the state. Uh, so is it going to be a V-shape? Is it going to be a U-shape, a W-shape? Well, who knows? Uh, at least I don't. Um, there is uh, the, the second stage, which is uh, the industry uh, level. And uh, what we have observed in this uh, executive uh, circle is uh, companies have been uh, impacted in very different ways. Uh, it's not, not so surprising. Um, so I don't know if you are familiar with the Maslow pyramid. It's, uh, well, anyway, not going into the Maslow pyramid. Uh, what we see is that uh, uh, there is a big uh, coming back to essential goods. And in terms of consumption, uh, it was very interesting to see uh, how certain sectors had to completely uh, stop. Like, for example, if you take the car industry or airplane, uh, the uh, flight industry, from one day to the other, they stopped selling cars. Uh, people stopped uh, traveling uh, using planes, etc. They stopped their factories, etc. Uh, so, they have been very deeply impacted. And on the other hand of the spectrum, uh, you had companies that, uh, which uh, almost uh, had the uh, opposite uh, issue, which is, for example, if you are in the food industry, companies such as Danone, for example, their big challenge was not uh, to stop, it was the contrary. It was, how can I keep uh, feeding uh, people? How can I keep my uh, uh, factories producing food or, or uh, um, water, etc.? Um, so the impact has been very different from one sector to the other, and uh, in terms of recovery, uh, it, the recovery is going to be uh, also very different from one sector to the other. So that was the second level, it's at the level of the industry. And then there is a, uh, the, the company level, uh, and more specifically, uh, um, 
what we have observed uh, in this circle is that uh, there is, when it comes to the product or the services that these companies are selling, uh, some of the, for some of them there is, a, uh, it's like, it's back to the roots, uh, like we want to simplify the uh, product or service portfolio to go back to the essential rather than having uh, 250 uh, uh, different products with different marketings for every single product, etc., It's going back to uh, simplicity. And for other companies, it's uh, back to the future. And what I mean here is that um, if, if you take, uh, for example, uh, large companies in the oil and gas uh, industry, uh, you had already ongoing trends towards more sustainable energy, etc. And the, the big boats were, uh, had already started turning around. But now, due to the crisis, this, uh, this change of uh, direction has been uh, accelerated by a, a, a huge factor. Uh, because due to the crisis, for example, if you look at the oil uh, price uh, that has completely dropped down, companies has, have to focus. And rather than keeping investing on uh, legacy uh, technologies or products or services, they have to focus on the future and invest in the future. So that was the uh, second trend that I wanted to share with you. It was uh, related to the, the shape of the recovery, which is, of course, depending on uh, the uh, industry and the company. And the third one, and this uh, will uh, uh, take us back to the, uh, the thing uh, related to COVID. Uh, what we are currently observing, and I think this is true in all industries, in all companies, uh, there is a very strong acceleration of transformations that were already uh, undergoing, uh, uh, and especially the, uh, the digital transformation. Uh, if you remember, uh, back a few weeks ago or a few months ago, uh, when the, the crisis started and when the lockdown started, um, there, there were a number of uh, new constraints. Uh, we had to fight the virus, we had to fight the economical crisis, and large corporates, large companies started to propose uh, innovations. And uh, these innovations could be of, uh, could take different shapes. Uh, it can be new products, completely innovative products. Uh, very often it has been also existing products which have been uh, hacked or transformed or adapted to fight the vi virus or to provide solutions. For example, I, I guess you have, most of you have heard about the uh, uh, mask, breathing mask from Decathlon uh, due, uh, to do uh, scuba diving. Uh, these masks uh, have been uh, uh, slightly uh, transformed to uh, make breathers to help people breathe. Uh, another way uh, large corporates uh, have been innovating is uh, they have uh, provided their um, industrial capaci uh, capacities to uh, produce what we needed, uh, for example, uh, gel, uh, masks, these kind of things. Um, and I'm saying that because I think it's very, uh, what I find very interesting in that is, you know, over the last few years, uh, it was quite trendy to say that large corporates uh, don't, any vote, um, don't any innovate anymore, uh, that only startups could innovate, etc. And what we have seen in the crisis is, is that uh, actually uh, even big companies uh, with big legacy can be very fast and ver very innovative. Uh, and that uh, is really a um, uh, symptom of the acceleration uh, of the trends that I was mentioning before, and in particular the digital transformation. Um, if you look at the companies, there has been, uh, if you look at the ways of working, for example, we have been uh, all, um, or at least most of us, uh, working from home. Uh, so it has accelerated the new ways of working, uh, teleworking, uh, et cetera. And that, I think it's not just a, a peak reaction uh, during the crisis. Uh, this has created uh, long-term expectations. Uh, people and companies have realized that it's actually possible to work from home and it's possible to be efficient even though you work from home. And it has also raised a number of uh, questions because of course you will have to find the right balance between uh, professional life and personal life. Uh, other questions also as leaders, 
Um, how can you be a good leader when you work remotely? How do you man maintain this, this uh, tight connection with, you as a, with your team as a leader? So there are also a number of, of course, of questions to be answered. And still related to the digital transformation, I would like to conclude on uh, how to fight COVID. Um, I think it's very interesting to see how various countries and various cities have tried to, uh, to fight against COVID. And uh, if, you look, uh, if you look at it, and I'm maybe speaking under your control, there are three uh, different kind of strategies to fight COVID that we have observed. Uh, the, the, the first one uh, is containment. For containment, you need to test, you need to trace, and you need to have targeted containment, uh, contain, uh, targeted um, lockdown, if you want. And this is typically what uh, um, South Cor Korea has, has done, and it seems very efficient. Uh, the second manner is kind of a hybrid between, no, I'm, I'm going to speak about the third one and uh, the one in the middle is uh, like in between. The third manner is, uh, is called suppression. And it's typically what we have done uh, in most uh, countries in Europe. Uh, it's when it's kind of too late, uh, we don't have resources to uh, do uh, mass testing, to trace people, etc., and we lock down everything. And then there is a, the third strategy, which is called mitigation, which is kind of in between. And um, to go back to what uh, Olga was, uh, was saying just before, uh, this third strategy uh, from an economical standpoint is terrible because we can see that the, uh, I mean the, the crisis is, uh, is, ter is terrible and it's probably just the beginning. While uh, the first one, uh, containment, may be more difficult to implement because you need uh, to have tests available in, uh, I mean, broadly. Uh, you need to be able to trace people, which means that you need uh, these digital technologies, which raises a number of questions about uh, privacy and all that. But from an economical standpoint, standpoint I think it's, it's, it's a lot more efficient uh, for the countries and for the cities. So these were the, I hope it was not too long and too, too bo not too boring, but uh, these are three trends uh, that we have observed uh, within our circle, which I think are quite interesting. Thank you, Albert. For sure, not boring. Olga, can you just rebond on this regarding the city and what you think will be uh, for the next? Well, yes, the role of cities in the future is indeed a very interesting subject. Looking back at economic history, cities have usually been a place of economic progress. We need often intense human interaction. We need to exchange ideas to come up with new ideas. Also, we just like to meet. We like to mingle as humans. So I do think the future of cities is there will be cities. We will not go back on urbanization. The challenge is to make the cities more livable, to make them greener, to make them cooler. We will find a new balance between work, working from home, sometimes remote, sometimes working from remote spaces, and physically meeting with the colleagues, with the boss, with the clients. There will be a new balance, but in the new balance, we will still have the need for places to meet physically. We will want to meet for work, for leisure, for pleasure. So for me, the real question is, what do we learn from the pandemic about A, being prepared to have a more containment-focused strategy in the future? As we just heard, that of course would be optimal, but it needs preparations to be able to do that. And secondly, we need to rethink cities so that they can be and can remain the great places to mingle, to work, to meet for leisure and pleasure, but can be greener, cooler, and more pleasant than they have been recently. Thank you, Olga. And I will go back on this, how to make the city better for us. But for this, we need to understand how to, how this pandemic come from. And I was asked, uh, how can we be better prepared if a new pandemic is coming? Um, and I need to say that the question is not if a new pandemic is coming, but when the next pandemic will be coming. Because we need to understand why we, we face this, uh, this pandemic. So where it comes from, 
if we, we ask, we, we can say, we will say, okay, it's come from China. But in fact, it could have come from anywhere uh, in the tropical uh, strip and plus Europe, plus North, North America. This area are the hotspot for the next epidemic emergence location. And we need to pay attention to this location in order to understand how to decrease this, um, this risk of, um, of emergence. So why, how can we be able to, um, to say that here we have some, uh, some hotspots? It's because we notice also that in the last 40 years, almost 75% of the emerging disease were zoonoses. Zoonoses are diseases from animal world who will jump to humankind uh, when there is a, an opportunity. And this is the key point, the opportunity for the disease to jump from animal to humankind. So, and we need to understand how in the last decade, all the human activity make this interface between animal and human is really growing very fast. We have this intensive farming, the deforestation, the resource expl exploitation, which make wildlife having more contact with humankind. This is how the HIV come in humankind. This is how the uh, cholera come also in the humankind. So we have also urban spreading. So we might think that urban spreading will spare us from animal disease, but on the 4.5 billion human who are living in the city, 1.5 of them are living in slum area, where you have a lot of poultry and pig in almost each of the backyard. So all of this, all of this land use changing the last 300 years, this make this opportunity of the zoonosis become human, uh, um, fit to the humankind anyway. Every four months, we have a new zoonosis disease who come from animal to humankind. So we will say, okay, it, it's statistic. We were not lucky with this COVID-19. I would say we will, we have been lucky because it was COVID-19 and it was not Ebola like this with fever, hemorrhagic or some kind of other stuff. So, and with all the human activity we have now, these four months might reduce and all the repetition of emergent disease, we might have the risk for a new pandemic with a much more lethal um, uh, fate and um, bigger syndrome. So we need now to um, calm down all of this um, way we are doing with this um, uh, deforestation and intensive farming and everything like this. But we need also to look for what we want for our city because we already say this, we are in an urban world. And how, how can we do now for having um, a city who are not hostile, uh, you will say, okay, a city are not hostile. But I'm a mother of four, and uh, I have twins who are uh, one year and a half, and I kept them to the pediatrician last week. I said, okay, they are big enough, I put the stroller at home. It was a nightmare just for five meters, because they are run everywhere, and I was scared that they will go on the road. And in fact, nobody, leave their children in the city. Two, two, two generations ago, all the children are, were playing the street. Everyone was exploring the city and the area to play. And playing is the way the development is doing in children. The cognitive development, the affective development. And now with the city, it's more like a car carousel and we need to go back on this public space. And for me, the, we will be able to say, okay, we are good with the city that we have, if we are able to let our four years old go to the bakery by himself, just around the corner. For now, we can do this. So we need to have this goal. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Frederick. Maybe if we have some question.
Voilà, merci de, de m'avoir branché le micro. Alors, Thank you for giving me the mic. Um, we have a quick question. We're very much behind schedule. We have a lot of questions that have come in. And, um, Anne and, and everyone else, I'm, I would like to put the following question to you. What a big question, what a big issue. For example, uh, Dr. Olga Smigling. Well, advice to investors. At the moment, I would say we are having a good economic rebound. We are having very low interest rates. We are having central banks and fiscal policy that are helping. So we are, in a way, in a sweet spot of the business cycle for many markets, including equity markets. But we also need to be aware that this sweet spot will not last, that there are risks from the virus, from the US election. And we need to be aware that we have to look more closely at companies and individual investments than before, because there are sectors, there are companies that only survive now because of extra debt, which now is cheap. But times will come a few years from now when debt is no longer that cheap. And then those companies that only survive because of extra debt will be in trouble, whereas those companies who are now in the lead of the digital technological transformation, who do not need to take on much debt to get through the pandemic, those companies will look even better relative to others in the future. That also holds probably very much for parts of the real estate sector. So we need to very closely study debt and we need to study very closely how this economic recovery is unfolding and what the risks are out there. Thank you. Merci à vous. Uh, Albert Mege. Well, thank you very much indeed. Albert Mege, over to you. Maybe to, uh, to build on what uh, Olga was uh, saying, uh, digital transformation is definitely uh, one of the key areas. Uh, at the moment, companies need to uh, cut costs. And one way to cut cost is to improve performance thanks uh, to digital, uh, digital technologies. So this is one thing. And uh, if you want to go deeper, just contact us uh, at my company and we will uh, give you the right advice. Uh, not for free, though. Merci beaucoup. Hashtag uh, product placement. Voilà. Well, I would like you to give our three speakers a very warm round of applause and vielen Dank, uh, Olga. Thank you, all three. Let's take a break and be back at 11.15. We have a 15-minute break to meet with uh, President uh, Sarkozy, and uh, we will be back once again at 11.15 sharp. At 12 in the auditorium, we're going to be launching the largest initiative to re-employ, um, for re-employment with different companies like Jacina, Cogedim, Engie, Groupama, Bouygues, BNP, ICAD, and uh, the purpose is to focus primarily on low carbon buildings by re employing, reusing, recycling uh, previously used material. It's better for the planet, obviously. Once again, let's be back at 11.15. Thank you.
Voilà, ça y est. OK, welcome back. Thank you for once again being with us at La Scène Musicale or remotely. Welcome back here. To open this, uh, this session, uh, the first contribution comes from uh, Nikita Stasinchin. Is, uh, it's an honor for us to welcome him uh, to the stage. He's in charge of development and implementation of state policy and legal regulation, uh, such as defining the housing policy and managing the development of housing, mortgage lending, housing cooperatives, rental housing market, and he supervises the Department of Housing Policy of the Ministry of Construction, Housing and Utilities of the Russian Federation. Please a big round of applause for the Deputy Minister of Construction, Housing and Utilities of the Russian Federation, Mr. Nikita Stasichin. Merci beaucoup de l'accueillir. Good morning. You know, Today, uh, I want uh, to talk about urban housing, uh, including planes and uh, development. Uh, I will focus in, um, first of all, in uh, Russian experience, but after, I hope, we can have a good talk about uh, global development. Uh, the main police document today in Russia uh, for urban development is a national project, which name is Housing and Urban Environment. Russian government has um, adopted national projects uh, for different areas uh, to help uh, establish the next steps for economic stability and development. So, uh, for what we need a uh, special national project, national project. First of all, uh, the national project helps national government and uh, regional government focused uh, and uh, have a similar uh, understanding of necessary measures. We hope to develop a mortgage market, uh, increase the numbers of loans, uh, and set the areas to less than 8%, because uh, today uh, we built about uh, 80 million square meter for a year. It's too much, but you know, uh, uh, we have, of course, big cities, big regionals, but we have small cities where live people who want to have beautiful um, industrial housing. They want to have good life. And um, when we talk with them, uh, we just want to know uh, what kind of city they want to change, in what kind of uh, territories or they want to change in their city. It's, it's very, very, um, first of all, it's very, I think, uh, difficult uh, to uh, tell the regional government how, to, how they need to build it, what they need to build it, what want people who live in their cities uh, and what they want uh, to have uh, from after two or three years. When we speak about for whom we do it, for us, I think uh, we need to think about uh, our children because, uh, you know, maybe 10, 15 years later, uh, the building, the development will be absolutely uh, stopped if they now don't change some rules how to build, how to uh, have uh, to plan. Uh, first, uh, uh, we have to plan uh, not district development, uh, but I think block development, uh, we can focus on comfort. It's very important for our country. It's very important for our people who live, and it, it will be very, very important for our children who will live after us because in this place, in these uh, areas, uh, and they will have uh, many, many, some special objects for this. Uh, what about COVID and what about what happens in our uh, country? You know, uh, we've stopped all development in two regions, Moscow and Moscow region. We stopped for two days, uh, uh, for 
two months, but two days, uh, about 15 million square uh, development. It was very difficult to uh, start them uh, after pandemic because, um, you know, we many people who work in a building in uh, our government uh, don't, doesn't understand how to open uh, all develops uh, before we can uh, be, that it was it, that it, it will be not so dangerous uh, uh, when it was okay because now of course uh, we have a special standard uh, uh, which we uh, which we go give to all the regional government to all the planes uh, all the buildings uh, and all the company now uh, work with this standard. It's very good for people uh, who work there, it's very good for people who live near, and it's very good for all uh, construction. You know, in 10 years later, we need to um, build about 120 million square a year. It's much, it's um, but uh, the, the main question, uh, how to build it uh, in uh, many regions? Because and I think that uh, when the national projects go, we need to know uh, that all the regional government in our country uh, can do it, uh, won't do it, and how to do it. That's, I think, we need to discuss. Thank you very much. Thank you, a big thank you, uh, Mr. Nikita Stazinchin. Uh, Let's now switch to our panel discussion. As you know, this uh, forum is an opportunity for people to interact. Uh, let me just remind you that uh, around 3 p.m. this afternoon, we're going to have a, a, a panel conference with, uh, on the Champs-Élysées uh, on re the re-enchantment of the Champs-Élysées the Parisian Champs-Élysées, and hopefully we will get an opportunity to discuss this as well with the mayor of Paris. Um, opened by the, the, the minister is a very in, uh, interesting uh, session to discuss the lessons uh, learned from the COVID-19 uh, crisis for the built environment. What are the key issues, what are the challenges uh, in terms of uh, mobility, urban density, infrastructure, urban planning, housing markets, many subjects, and uh, how to analyze this the, the main factors that have changed our urban lives and the industry since the beginning of uh, this pandemic, which was at the beginning of March, and how to imagine the world of tomorrow, how to imagine the city of tomorrow. These are the different topics we, uh, we will uh, discuss uh, together, uh, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to, um, to thank uh, the two persons, the two experts that will be uh, with us, um, the, the mayor of Rome, uh, Virginia Raggi, uh, she's uh, in Rome, but uh, here in Paris and online uh, through streaming. And the uh, mayor of Paris, Mrs. Anne Hidalgo. Anne Hidalgo nous rejoint. And Hidalgo is joining us, and I think we have Virginia Raji with us. Good to have you. Thank you, Mrs. Hidalgo, for being with us. It is a pleasure to have you with us this morning. We're going to uh, interact. Uh, we're going to give the floor to the mayor of Rome. Um, she uh, was kind enough to accept our invitation. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Can you but, hear me? Yeah, perfect. Uh, my, my first question, um, thank you uh, once again to, to join us today. What are the consequences of the, this major city we are faced with, according to you, and from the Rome and Italy point of view? Okay, so thank you, first of all. Thank you all, and thank you for this privileged opportunity to exchange and sharing even if we are online and not in person. 
Uh, well, I think that the global crisis generated by the spread of the COVID-19 disease is unprecedented. It is a crisis that affected directly and indirectly our economies, habits, the trade exchange, the free movement of people, the inner DNA of our society. The pandemic mainly affected cities, the main place for socializing, the place where people choose to live together, where they work, they study, create bonds, meet, develop their creativity and their future. So the real challenge to me uh, is of this time is the resilience. Resilience today can be declined in three directions. The three R, we can say, initials of Rome, but also of reinvest, regeneration, and restart. So let's start. If you want, you talk about reinvest, regeneration, and restart. And let's start with uh, reinvesting, meaning targeting specific action and investments. Yes, reinvesting to me means returning to invest, to use and manage all the available resources for the promotion of person and of the territory. Investing in creativity in factories and theater. In one word, investing in our communities. We need, in the COVID era, fast, effective, and above all, flexible responses. Recession, in, in time of recession, we must plan a season of strong public investment that shall bring about new administrative regulations. Today, Rome, which is a capital of 3.5 million people, looks to the other European capitals like Paris or Berlin, which have peculiar structures and articulation of powers. Keywords, so are de-bureaucratization, de digitalization, research, innovation and technology, and shared electric and sustainable mobilities. So, second part, it's regeneration. What does it mean for the built environment? Well, regeneration means giving back to citizens places that sometimes have been abandoned, unused, or no longer necessary to the territory. Places that can become engine of a redevelopment of entire neighborhoods, being able to introduce new function into the urban fabric, like residential, social, cultural, commercial, sustainable economy and technological development. And they can thus contribute to improving the urban quality and livability of a city. So the last, let's talk about the near future with you, uh, Virginia Raji, restarting, meaning startly, starting differently. Exactly, restarting is the last key word. Culture, hospitality and tourism are, the, are, are I can say, our key words for the restart. Culture represents Rome uh, DNA. Over 200 archaeological sites and areas, an inestimable open-air artistic heritage that we have. Outdoor living and outdoor fruition uh, of the archaeological heritage make Rome an enjoyable and safe city for the return of international tourists. UNWTO Secretary General made his first visit abroad after COVID emergence in Rome, an icon of international tourism, wishing a fast recovery of tourism in Rome and anywhere else. The recovery from the crisis must be inclusive. It is necessary to start again together as a community. We need to emphasize a particular type of resilience, social resilience. The social closeness is our vision of the city, a city where no one is left behind. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking part. It was a, an honor to have you, Virginia Raji. Je vous demande d'applaudir, Virginia Raji. Merci beaucoup. Arrivederci. Arrivederci. Au revoir. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Voilà, ça, ça donne le ton. Uh, okay, I friend. think it just sets uh, the tone. Uh, thank you, and Hidalgo, for being with us uh, this morning. I think we just heard a lot of interesting things. Turning to you uh, and uh, thinking about all the things that you have um, uh, engaged in, radical transformation programs in the city. You've been very, very committed in changing public space, mobility. Uh, we just had the example of uh, 
uh, of Rome and the consequences the crisis has had on on uh, on Rome. How much? Uh, what ha what has been the impact of COVID-19 on on your work? Well, I think it confirms that we have to accelerate things. We have to continue things. When we uh, started in Paris, uh, when we decided to engage in this ecological and uh, energetic transition, we uh, carefully analyzed what needed to be changed. Um, in the area of mobility, for example, giving uh, a, a more room, more space to active mobility, such as uh, walking, uh, cycling. Um, I think that this uh, has been um, uh, has been one of our key efforts, uh, and people are sometimes very conservative. But then, when you see what's happening today, it looks like you are actually spearheading. Uh, you were ahead of the others. Yes, I, I, I think so indeed. I think the coronavirus simply shows that we need a different model. We, we need a new model with new solutions. And when we talk about environmentalism, ecology, living together, better life together, when we see how the quality of life needs to be improved, it, it goes through profound changes, sometimes radical changes in our economic model and how we travel and how we consume and how we produce. And um, what, what the, the, the health crisis reveals is uh, that in the times to come, in, in, in the future, more and more, our societies will need to be resilient. And we, um, I, th I think Virginia Raji just said this, we've worked extensively on this concept and we've tried to translate this in concrete ways our human societies collectively as human beings uh, uh, in our cities we, we need to be prepared to anticipate crises and overcome crises how do we do this well by informing the population by engaging involving people and that's very much what you do. Absolutely, that's what we do. We involve people as much as we can. And I think that one of the key lessons of the COVID-19 crisis, which is not over, by the way, is that we should not uh, abandon our objectives. Um, uh, I, I think that they're very, uh, very compatible. And they will help us become even more resilient when facing uh, health risks. We had anticipated some scenarios. In the city of Paris, we, we had a big focus, which was on the risk of terrorism, uh, of course, for obvious historical uh, reasons, uh, especially with the trial of uh, the Charlie attacks. We, 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 we focused a lot to see what it takes to recover after terrorist attacks. The, the impact of the terrorist atta uh, uh, attacks had been terrible. Um, the impact on tourism was terrible. OK, so we shouldn't really talk about before and after, but instead we need to talk about a more resili resilient cities, more flexible cities, absolutely. And that goes through citizens first. We have, a, we have objectives, very clear objectives, with uh, a very strong environmental chapter but also a very so strong social chapter. People must be informed. People have to be engaged and involved. And uh, I think one of the learnings of the COVID-19 crisis is um, that, that, that we, we have spearheaded uh, a, a, a number of, of, of initiatives. We've identified the people who were really is indispensable in cities, even when it is being hit hard, even when the city comes to a standstill because of the lockdown. There are people we need. There's, we need those who are responsible of our health, healthcare professionals, those who watch after the more, most fragile people, public, private sectors, non-for-profit organizations. It's all the invisibles, all the invisibles who became visible. Those who are responsible for the food supply, uh, cashiers working in supermarkets and grocery stores, and so on. All these people, by definition, um, uh, are, are, are people who are, are even more important in cities um, that, that, that are speculating where real estate prices are skyrocketing. And in these cities, we need them even more. 
there will be other crises. There will be more. The, those key people, key players, need to be inside. They can't be pushed out of cities where they would have to travel back and forth long hours to commute to work. We need to build cities, the human communities, together in a much more consistent way, in a more coherent way, by integrating mixity. These are very important lessons, and they influence how we manage cities, how we organize them, uh, how we urbanize them. Urbanism is, uh, is that, is just that. Uh, right, and uh, instead of having, uh, you, we, you talked about having a more inclusive vision, and then we have this social and health crisis that hits us, that hits us very hard. Tell us a little bit about all how the the the, the urban the, the urban fabric has changed and 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 why? Well, I think that a lot of the changes we 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 we've gone through. We needed to make those changes. If we had not done this over the past six years, we would be considerably behind right now. We wouldn't be in the right position to allow citizens to live uh, good lives, acceptable lives, pleasant lives, uh, where they're not impacted by pollution like uh, we've been in, in the past. So if we hadn't done all this, uh, imagine what people would say or think about Paris. Of course, it's never easy. I was sharing this with Gregory Doucet, who is the mayor of the city of Lyon. Um, it's very difficult. People are A lot of people are very conservative, and it is in the interest of a lot of people to not change anything because they're, they're in good shape and they, want it, they, want, they, they don't want things to change. But I think the vast majority of people do have an interest in change and want change. They want environmental change. They want to improve their purchasing power. They want more inclusion. They want to live better lives together. And um, for the French at large, I think that the, the very question of the republic, um, what it means to be a republic, I think, is also very much um, at question. Um, and, and taken into consideration. Of course, we have all the visible changes, all the visible transformations with Emmanuel Grégoire, my first deputy, and, and other people who are here in the room. We have take, we've made two important decisions, two governance decisions that we're going to apply from now on. Based on the previous term, what we learned from my first term, and the COVID-19 crisis, the first commitment is that more and more we're going to deconcentrate. We're going to uh, give more and more authority to each of the neighborhoods and each of the so-called arrondissements in Paris to be closer to the people, closer to the field. So we're going to deconcentrate, deconsolidate. And we need, of course, to have a long-term vision. Uh, we're a large city. Same thing is true for Rome, uh, Lyon, uh, Paris, and many other uh, um, foreign capitals. We need this very strong connection with uh, with the field, with people. We need uh, you know, we need to uh, uh, consider things at a micro local level. Thanks to Carlos Moreno, we have worked very very hard, and we we came to uh, realize that. People need to recognize one another. Within 15 minutes of where you live, people need to find everything they need. All services, kindergartens, uh, public services, culture, and so on. So within 15 minutes, we need, to, which means, of course, uh, this requires public transportation, mass transit, and so on. And then there is the question of governance. We talked about governance. It's not top down anymore, and this is a major revolution. There's a second important topic I wanted to discuss with you, and which, of course, uh, is uh, of great interest to all of the people in this room or following online. How do you think construction can mutate 
can transform itself. And of course, how could you bring a little bit of reassurance to people in the construction sector? We all need to be aware that we all need to change, and people have already started to change and over the past six years as mayor. And with uh, Jean-Louis Missica, who was also deputy mayor, we have uh, worked on reinventing Paris through a project called Reinventer Paris, where we changed our approach, uh, another approach than that of the ZAC system. We moved down to a more grassroots level and uh, used a call for projects uh, where professionals of the construction sector, other economic stakeholders, uh, companies involved in social housing, but also in private housing, but also community groups in the field could work together on proposals. So a co-construction, so indeed. Indeed, and there are some very beautiful projects that have already been brought to fruition. For instance, the uh, Ferme du Rail in the 19th arrondissement, where uh, there are shared gardens, allotments, uh, social, uh, the social economy, and also to make it economically viable. Of course, there are also private sector activities. But what a lot of uh, people in real estate have told me about the process we initiated six years ago is that we have all moved forward. We have all made progress. If we, as the public authorities, had not said, let's change, let's change our methods, let's try to show that it's a win-win situation, I'm not sure that they would have wanted to. So you created a kind of virtuous circle, is that it? Yes, in a sense, and I think we're going to continue to uh, put forward that uh, signal. And uh, I, we can now witness that in construction, there is now increased use of biosource materials, of wood, uh, there is reuse of materials, there's also construction site management, which has greatly improved. A lot of things are prefabricated outside. And and all of this uh, has made progress. And then uh, there's also a crucial tool, which is the PLA, the Local Urbanism Plan. That will be one of the assignments for Emmanuel Grégoire uh, in order to engage this revision of the local urban plan to factor in issues of uh, environmental energy efficiency, adapting cities to climate change with surfaces that must be planted, uh, that should really be built into this uh, PLU, which is, of course, a crucial plan. So it's interesting. Now you do things, you build things in before as a prerequisite rather than doing things after. Yes, it's a prerequisite. Of course, the PLU, when revised, uh, there will be a uh, conference of citizens in the next Council of Paris Assembly. All of these issues will be discussed with the uh, Municipal Council. And I am very eager that uh, we, along with the uh, uh, profession can drive each other. We live in a world where we must accept a number of uh, aspects of the economic model, and I fully agree with what Virginia was saying earlier. This is not just restarting uh, in order for us to do the same thing as before. We are restarting and in this accelerating restart, we need to challenge the model. We need to challenge the economic model. What is the purpose of all this? What we do must be useful to human beings. And we need to question very openly uh, without being catalogued uh, or, called, uh, or called names. We need to be in a capacity to question 
Who should progress be serving? That is a crucial question for human societies, for uh, politicians, not only to be fearful of progress, but to keep progress under control and put it at the service of the greater number. Otherwise, it won't work. If it's only a tiny minority of the population of this planet decides for everyone else and are the only ones uh, who have an interest in a changing world. So, Anya Hidalgo, you're always uh, promoting this, uh, promoting ideals of inclusion, co-construction, uh, citizen involvement. But if we uh, drill deeper for all uh, the real estate and construction professionals who are following us, uh, perhaps a new trend that is picking up uh, is now uh, mutability, transformability, and mixed uses in construction. You need to work from home or bring your office closer to home. Yes, it's true, and that transformation is something that we need to work on together. And in the PLU that we voted for in 2006 was a great plan uh, where we put uh, the share of uh, housing versus office space uh, to avoid all of the east-west uh, commuting. We had worked already on a pretty effective PLU. But today, and notably with the unprecedented economic crisis that will be appearing because of COVID, uh, we need to question uh, the role of construction. In my previous term of office, we worked with uh, professionals in the sector to transform 350,000 square meters of office space into housing. I think, again, we're going to need to work further on that issue. We have a, a tool called the APUR, the Paris Urbanism Workshop, but we've also worked with the regional prefect to go further and to identify and earmark a number of buildings that can be transformed from uh, economic activity towards housing. And I believe that if we are to rebuild the city over the city, uh, that is something we need to work on together. And we need to work with the sector to see how they can be incentivized to take that path. Uh, but I certainly believe that the time has come of course, a crisis can be something that you can just uh, suffer from and just hope for a return to the situation in the past. Or else, you can consider that, of course, we uh, would have well done very well without the crisis. There were many uh, fatalities, many people are sick, a lot of tension in healthcare. But the situation can also be leveraged to accelerate and try to move forward a more balanced more equal, fairer world. And I think that even on the side of businesses and their economic model, and particularly uh, in the field of construction and real estate, we can work together. So indeed, we saw during this crisis that the relationship with cities, with uh, housing, uh, seems to have uh, focused on increased inequality. So uh, research was conducted, but it seems that the majority of the French when asked what their ideal home would be, uh, the results were rather unexpected. Uh, people said, I would like something with more air because I'd like to work from home uh, with a little garden or perhaps a terrace or a deck. Yes, absolutely, that's the direction we're taking. Uh, Paris is an extremely dense, densely uh, built city. It's the densest city in Europe, 20,000 inhabitants per square meter, and Virginia. Uh, has a very large city with a lot of space. So we're a densely built city in which we've managed to reconquer 
some space uh, for green spaces or for other uses than cars. And uh, that is where we found the most space to reconquer, and that's what we did. Uh, space is dedicated to, uh, to cars. But uh, people's apartments tend to be rather small. The middle classes in Paris often choose to stay in Paris in a smaller flat. And they very often say that they want to stay in Paris because Paris has an educational, cultural, and economic environment that allows them to thrive and think about a future for their children. So they accept the constraint of a smaller apartment. But during lockdown, when people had to stay within these tiny apartments, it creates tensions. So, of course, the public space, which is, in a sense, a common extension of the private space of people in a given neighborhood becomes something crucial. And that's what we're working on. For instance, in the city of the uh, 15 minutes of travel that we're working on would be that everywhere in Paris and also outside Paris, um, life is very much organized around schools, even for people who don't have kids. The neighborhood is very much conditioned by how schools work. So the schools must become the central focus points, and they must be more open. They must uh, be more welcoming. And they must be there uh, to welcome people, for instance, uh, when there's a heat wave, uh, to make sure that there's more vegetation in the school yards. We have already started working on that. Uh, we call them the oasis courtyards. That was part of our strategy. So you're saying that schools could serve as a focal point to attract people? Yes, they could also, at the weekend, or at night, they could be more welcoming in these oasis courtyards. They could welcome perhaps people who need fresh air or a little bit of space for kids to play in at the weekend if you can't make it all the way to the nearest public park. But you could use these schools as a destination for together togetherness within a neighborhood. So these are extremely interesting developments. Um, it's highly, uh, of course, uh, it creates some anxiety, but it's also very exciting. And if you engage with professionals, with citizens, with uh, community groups, and with elected representatives, I think we could probably really come up with uh, very practical solutions that would be a manner uh, of saying that the vision of the uh, green transition is uh, not something that is a myth, that is totally unreachable. Things can be constructed in a very practical way and much quicker than we believe. So you're talking about social diversity, it's something um, that would also be concerned. Yes, of course. In Paris, very clearly, uh, the real estate market is highly speculative. I'm often asked, and they say, ah, yes, but what have you done about um, the uh, real estate market? Well, not very much, because I have no power, no leverage, apart from obtaining what I obtained, which was regulation of rents. Um, conversely, where I have been able to act is on the production of social housing, of affordable housing. And we've now reached 23% affordable housing, which is huge for a major capital city. And that's perfectly in line with uh, our targets. In 2001, the number was 13%, so up 10%. These are not just figures. That just means that there are about 600,000 people who have access to affordable housing and who can live in Paris and who otherwise would not have been able to live in Paris. And these 600,000 people are families, very often middle class families, lower middle class, working class people who, of course, make a valuable contribution to the city's uh, services and economy. 
And really this question of social diversity and mixity, um, we have been fought um, fiercely in the past. But I mean, there, there are various aspects to that, of course. There's a philosophical standpoint, a political standpoint, an altruistic standpoint. But you can also take things into consideration through an economic approach. In order for a city to work, it needs to be mixed, it needs to be diverse, because if a city was purely a locus that allows the richest, those who can afford private services and private housing, the city would lose its attractiveness. A city draws people because it is diverse, and when it is diverse. Look at a city like Paris. Paris has an ecosystem of innovation which is highly efficient, and I believe that it is probably due to the diversity of Paris's population and the fact that part of these creative people chose to come to Paris to create their startups to bring their ideas to fruition because they have this capacity, this ability to live in a city, a highly cosmopolitan city with lots of different people from all walks of life. And in order to shorten distances within Paris, if you have shorter distances, you can enjoy uh, other aspects such as the cultural and educational aspects. So I would like you perhaps to send out a message to all of the people in the trade of our construction and real estate uh, sector. You were talking about inclusiveness in co-constructing the city of the future and the impulse you have given to that. What would your message be to that? I would say, do not be fearful of this innovation. Do not be fearful of challenging your models. Of course, it's always a difficult and complex thing to do, and there are always many interrogations about what the results will be. But I would tell them not to be fearful, because all of those who worked with us and who supported us in our highly uh, innovative approaches in the past few years in terms of architecture, in terms of uh, co-construction, in terms of materials, all of this, all of, the, all of these people consider that they have made progress and that they've saved time uh, in embracing developments that are going to come in the future. And then, of course, we do need the private sector, very much so. We need also to restore uh, the collective and the political. We need to restore the rights that belong to them. But all of this should not be seen as something that is working against business. Uh, quite the opposite. We need jobs. We're going to need support for businesses throughout this crisis, uh, businesses and their employees. The crisis is going to be terrible. So we need to remain confident. We need to stay ourselves, but also accept that democracy must Merci always have the last and final word. A big round of applause for Anne Hidalgo, who will stay minutes. here for another Virginia few Raggi. minutes. Uh, Virginia Raggi. Carefully to, uh, to what Anne Hidalgo said. Um, uh, a few minutes ago, you, you were talking about the need to have a more inclusive city, just like Anne Hidalgo, and you insisted on the fact that uh, we, we need to uh, to be very inclusive and uh, nobody has to be uh, left behind. Uh, how could you react at, uh, at the, um, the, um, the speech of, uh, of Anne Hidalgo? And perhaps I you have a question for her. No, I totally agree. I see that all the main cities are going in the same direction. We are talking about the changing even before the pandemic. And this was the, the, the path that we were trying to to, to follow and to lead at the same time. And what she said, when she said that nobody has to fear the change, I, I strongly and truly believe in this because changing is the, the basis of life. Transformation is something that belongs to us. 
Of course, the pandemic has been like an accelerator of all this changing, and we don't have to fear it. We have to lead and try to look forward and point to the place that we want to go, and we have to do it all together. Not to be afraid of the changes and no. considering something uh, like collapses as opportunities. Um, we have to, excuse me, we yeah. have to see that every crisis and every problem they, they hide a big opportunity. So we have to see that opportunity and not the problem. You're completely in phase with what you said, Anne Hidalgo. Anne Hidalgo, there's a question that I'd like to ask you concerning the Anne Hidalgo, I have a question for you about culture. Virginia Raggi was saying earlier that culture is in Rome's DNA. And that's another common point. Well, yes, of course, you know that Rome and Paris are twin cities. Uh, we have an exclusive twin city agreement with Rome. Rome cannot have another twin city than Paris, and Paris cannot have another twin city than Rome. And then, of course, there's the Treaty of Rome. And it's true that, to us, culture in Paris is very much part of our DNA. When I was talking about creative populations, populations, of course. I include artists into that, and all these men and women who help to reflect their vision of the world, or their interpretation of uh, uh, prior uh, creations. And to us, it's crucial that culture should be something that can be shared as widely as possible. In the 15-minute city I was talking about, the idea is that in this 15-minute city, that there should be a network of schools, of libraries, of uh, music schools, of uh, bookshops, which are, of course, uh, private sector businesses, that all of this could be networked with a very powerful synergy to also allow the artists in a given neighborhood and citizens of a given neighborhood, those uh, who are amateurs or, and those who are professionals, to get together and together reflect and express culture, which is crucial in that it elevates the human mind. That might be my conclusion, but I would say that if you watch a film or read a novel, you very often learn much more about society than by reading other types of literature or writings, which, of course, uh, are worthy in themselves. But I think it also allows us to uh, confront different visions of the world. And Paris is a city that breathes culture and the freedom to create, creative freedom, and that's very much part of our DNA. So we're getting a few questions through the Slido app, so please feel free to ask questions. I have a question for you, Anne Hidalgo. What is your priority between energy transition and quality of, of life and user-friendliness for people who live in cities? That you need, there's a balance that needs to be struck. I don't see any opposition. I think the green transition, the environmental transition, improves people's quality of life. When we created these cycle paths, we say, ah, yes, but how can uh, no one is going to be cycling, not everyone will be cycling in a city? No, of course not. But at least we're allowing everyone who wants to cycle uh, to cycle across 100% of the city. No one has lost anything. I have testimonials every day of people People, including of business leaders who say, ah, it's changed my life. I never would have imagined uh, that I would step out from my company car and I now cycle to work. And, uh, and of course, bicycles are also economical, they're cheaper. So people said, ah, oh, yes, but you're going to stop people who uh, come from outside Paris, to come work in Paris, they won't be able to do that, and it's going to increase social inequalities and so on. But in fact, if you look at people who use public transport and people who use the road, um, things are very obvious. Uh, people who do not have so much money from the most modest social classes take public transport, and they always have. And those who would drive into Paris, who continue to drive into Paris, 
tend to be uh, more affluent people. So I think it can, that is something that can improve quality of life. There are things that are not necessarily visible, uh, but that do have a terrible impact. Air pollution, for instance, kills tens of thousands of people every year in a city like Paris. In Paris, it's 6,000 direct deaths uh, connected to pollution, which is huge. Let me now ask Virginia Raggi. Of Roma in terms of uh, changing, uh, leaving the car in the parking and uh, and take the, the bicycle. Well, during the pandemic, people understood that, and of course we had laws specific on that. We couldn't really gather together uh, in the buses and public transport because we have to respect the, the physical distances. So people. Uh, um, in the lockdown, I mean, those who need to go to work, of course, and especially after, they understood that there could be another or a different way to, to move inside the city and was with a bicycle and kick scooters. So we, we started to build bicycle lane and um, bicycle path, and we have a law now that allow this construction more easily. So we're now building more than 150 kilometers of uh, bike lanes and people are very happy. If I can say one thing, uh, which to me it's quite uh, important and even uh, significant. We have a lot of accident, car accident and car crashes that injuries and, and, and kill people. And up to date, probably nobody and no media said car killed people. They always said uh, streets are dangerous um, or something like that. Now that bi uh, bicycle and kick scooters are like going uh, in, in, I mean, in all our cities, we see some accident with kick scooters, but not more so. I mean, someone may fall, okay? But it's normal. And now newspaper, they try to focus on how danger kick scooter are. And we are still not, focus on, on, not focusing on the problem, which is car can cause injuries and can kill people. And they are like focusing on kick scooters. That is not a problem. Pollution, car accidents, uh, high speed in a city, they are, uh, all are against quality of life. So we have to drive this, I mean, slowly and gently drive these changes that will improve our city and quality of life. Slowly and gently, mais vous vous retrouvez uh, Anne Hidalgo Absolutely. dans ce que dit Virginia Raggi. Uh, pour terminer, uh, Virginia Raggi nous a dit tout à l'heure dans, dans, so, dans son interview. Virginia Raggi was uh, saying earlier that in Rome, they also uh, turn towards Paris because Paris serves as a kind of lab, an innovation lab. What would you want to say to Virginia? Paris now talks to Rome. So, first of all, of course, Paris draws a lot of inspiration from Rome, from other capital cities of the world. Virginia, what she was saying about accidents, think of Amsterdam. Amsterdam is a city which uh, already in the late 70s uh, initiated a uh, cycling uh, policy. And the reason for that was car accidents, which uh, had really uh, generated uh, uh, a lot of concern in Amsterdam. A lot of children were killed on the road and so on. And I think perhaps the message I would like to deliver is a European message. As mayors of major cities across Europe, we also have a part to play today. Of course, it's difficult for mayors to work together. We have a network. We can inspire each other. We, of course, try to influence domestic policies and European policies in order for them to focus much more on issues of the environmental and energy transition. And I think that with Rome and other cities across Europe, we must also go and see the European Commission in order for European cities to be places, places that can also directly receive European funds to work on the transition. It will be quicker and more efficient than to pass through national governments. Of course, national governments need to remain.
remain. I am not saying that nation states are useless, but, for instance, in France, France is, is a country that is much too centralized and that does not leave sufficient space to local governments and municipalities uh, to work. And I think that is a fine territorial and democratic scale for us to act and accelerate the transition, which is absolutely essential. And perhaps also to accelerate a, a rebound as part of the European rebound and uh, act, uh, economic activity rebound plan, where we need to be stakeholders. A, a lovely conversation. Many thanks, Virginia Raggi, for joining us. Many voilà. thanks, and you know, envie de, encore plus loin dans, dans really ce makes you want to go even aussi. further in, the, in your twin Merci. cities. Merci. Twin Merci. ideas, Merci. twin Merci. visions. Merci. A great pleasure to Merci have Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. Merci. And see you in Roma. Ça nous invite à, à relire les promenades dans Rome de, de, de An invitation to read Stendhal's promenade. So we're going to take a five-minute break. And uh, so please stay with us. Challenges. Uh, ça va être vraiment intéressant. Donc, That's going to be a really interesting uh, roundtable panel discussion. So we're just going to uh, sanitize the table and we'll be right back at this uh, MIPIM Forum de la Ville, which is engaging and optimistic. On va reprendre tout de suite, mesdames, messieurs, avec... Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We're going to kick off our following session. Once again, thank you very much for being with us. As part of the uh, Urban Forum organized by uh, MIPIM, I'd like to thank all uh, the technical teams who have been supporting us and who have made this a smooth journey. journey. Um, a quick jingle before we kick off the Addressing Tomorrow's Challenges. So let's focus on how our industry can action to address the various issues highlighted by the pandemic. Once again, the idea is to offer you a practical, technical, concrete and operational answers to lead your business. So in the next 40 minutes, we're going to hear feedbacks and share experiences from a panel of experts. I remember, don't forget to prepare your questions via Slido. Uh, I call to the stage our moderator, uh, Courtney Finger, Editor-in-Chief for FTI NS Media Group, Paul Jäger, Managing Director of Russell Reynolds Associates, Olivier Esteve, qui est Deputy CIO CEO, pardonnez-moi, pour Covivio. Laurent Jacquemin, Head of Asia Pacific Real Assets for AXA, I am Real Assets. And Gregory Lancher, Chief Development and Construction Officer for the Club Med. So, Courtney, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And you, you've did, done me a favor of introducing my panelists to you so I don't have to mispronounce their uh, French surnames, which is a 
a, a challenge that I always have as an American. But welcome to the panelists and welcome to you. Thank you for joining us here. It's extremely exciting to be in a live event um, after all of these months and I'm enjoying it so far. I trust you are. Now, as you've seen, the, the subject of our panel today is addressing tomorrow's challenges. Now, we have enough challenges even today in the current state of the world, uh, more than we could discuss in, in 45 minutes. Um, but what we'll do is try to break down a little bit what are the key challenges that the market is facing at the moment. Many of them, you can guess at what they are. But more importantly, we'll talk about how they can be addressed, what the leaders of the industry can do, and how we can move forward, and then try to uh, inject some optimism in terms of looking at what opportunities can be found amidst all of the challenges. So I would like to ask uh, Paul first, um, who leads the financial services practice in France and the real estate practice in Europe for Russell Reynolds Associates, an executive search firm. Um, how are leaders in the industry, you're dealing with quite high level executives as, as part of your role. So what is the sort of reactions from the leaders of the industry um, and, and what are you hearing from them? Um, thank you. I would say that the first uh, lesson we had that leaders in the industry are taking this opportunity of this crisis to really understand what uh, these moments uh, can reveal about the leaders. It's a good opportunity to, to see more clarity in the leadership of the teams. The second uh, experience we see is that leaders currently are playing not only defensive but also offensive and we see something very specific there. The third uh, element is probably around the necessity to have new leaders looking outward and being able to really show the, the future to the others. That is really something we can see at the very moment. The last uh, um, element that we can definitely see in the specific uh, circumstances is about the values and the fact that leaders are demonstrating uh, values regarding courage, perseverance, and resilience. That these are definitely the main element that we can see in this specific period. And I guess there's a big implication for talent and workforce around the world with a lot of talk of working from home and, and what it means. Um, in, in your experience, is this overblown? Well, do we see a kind of global uh, shakeup in terms of where talent is located? Definitely. And I think it's a good opportunity for the top leaders to redeploy the leaders of their organization in new areas. and take the opportunity to change the perimeters and give new territories to the leaders and especially to the rising leaders. That's a great opportunity, a great moment to give new challenges to the new generation of leaders, definitely, but also for the old generation to take the opportunity to let the new generation, let's say, uh, raise and, and, and shine some, some like, like stars. You know, that's a, a very important moment now. Thank you. So seed way for the, for the new generation to help find some of the solutions to the problems, I think. Definitely. I would also just uh, put some emphasis on the fact that for us in the future, the organizations who will be definitely winning are those who will definitely take this advantage currently to invest on the future leaders. This is really, so everybody can think that this period will be an opportunity to acquire uh, talents very easily, that will not be the case. Mm -hmm. I think we must think about that. Uh, uh, most of the current leaders will not move easily, and I think the organization who have a specific view on that, on the, on the, the strategy for acquire new talents, mm -hmm. will be making a big difference. So my recommendation is definitely to think about that, and if we say who will be the winners in one year, the winners will be those who will be able to start a new strategy to acquire the new generation of leaders. Thank you very much. Now, Olivier is in one of these leadership positions as a deputy CEO at an investment and development company. So how are you preparing the company and your workforce and, and, and helping support recovery of the market? No small job there. <laughs> no small job, I have to say. Uh, and I share totally the point of Paul about uh, leadership and uh, the opportunity of the crisis on that topic. 
Um, so for us, uh, what, what can we say about the crisis? Our feeling is uh, um, it just reinforces and accelerates some trends uh, which were already, uh, uh, I would say, present in, uh, in our world, and especially the, the, the needs of flexibility, uh, the digitalization of organization, uh, the needs for services. And for us, tomorrow, real estate, and especially offices, uh, have to tackle uh, the, the question of, of course, always location, but also this, uh, this new flexibility is not only flexibility in the, in the workspace, but also flexibility in the contract. So it's a really a, a complete approach. And uh, of course, sustainability, and a new, maybe a new topic emerging is about care. Uh, we had the well-being, and now we have also all those questions around uh, uh, what, uh, what happens with the pandemic and what could happen in the, in the future. Um, the, 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 the main issue today, if I look at uh, the, the, the different asset class where, where we are involved, uh, I will come back on hotel. And, but for offices, the main question is about this question of remote working and what could happen uh, tomorrow. For us, there is a, a positive outcome uh, because our feeling is that office building will become more and more strategic for, uh, for, the, for the organization, for corporation. Uh, because it's a, it's a way to embody the, 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 the company culture, uh, to reinforce uh, team efficiency, uh, to, um, to improve creativity, serendipity, and it will become a, a key point also to attract talent. And, uh, and for us, a company is a social organization. We are human beings. We need to, to work together. And, uh, and for us, it's the one a very positive output. And, uh, I, I just uh, mean that uh, after the lockdown, it was really impressive to see the team uh, coming back at the office and how they were happy to work again together and, uh, and after on the terrace, uh, after work uh, was uh, really impressive. For us as investors, it changed a little bit the approach. Uh, two years ago, the motto was uh, real estate industry uh, shifting from uh, uh, financial to services. We are definitely in an era of services, but it doesn't mean not only services in the building, but it, it, it means a, a really a complete approach and to be able to, to provide our clients, our stakeholder, tailor-made solution. And it means that in our company, we have to create new field of expertise. We have to attract talent leaders to be able to, to bring what we can bring to the, of course, to the client, but also to the cities uh, and to, uh, I would say, uh, the society. Um, uh, and uh, for uh, the, the last question was about what could happen in one year, and uh, I'm not a crystal ball for sure. Huh? Uh, we have a huge challenge in front of us, but uh, uh, maybe a, a negative point is about the, the size of the market in terms of offices, because what I mentioned probably will push a decrease of the volume, but it means that to, to, to play a major role in that game, we have to be able to provide, I would say, it's. Uh, of course, obvious, but best building with the best location, the best combo of services, and, uh, and companies are more and more uh, thinking about a combo of remote working, offices, flexible solution, and we are able to do that. And uh, to be more positive, I would say it's also an opportunity because uh, to, to rebase our hypothesis, for example, with location, and for, maybe it's an opportunity for the Grand Paris, for example, uh, because when you look at this, uh, this fantastic project, we were also uh, a little bit constrained by the idea that we have to be more central, to have large business district. Maybe tomorrow, if you work two, two days from your home, the question of commuting is not the same. And uh, so maybe it's an opportunity also to, uh, to, to look differently the development of the, the, all the country and especially the, the great par greater Paris. Residential, I say no worries for us because it's uh, probably the lowest uh, risk of obsolescence. And uh, of course, issue for, uh, I would say, affordable housing, etc. But uh, it was already there. And at the end, the hotel, like <laughs> the, the, the most difficult part, because we are sure that people will come back, tourism, to, 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 we, we need to, to travel, to play, to, to, to discover new, uh, uh, new countries, etc. But the, the, the main question is the, the, the speed of the recovery. And do you think the real estate industry is nimble enough to react to this? sudden need for more flexibility? Yes, I think it's, uh, but it's, uh, of course, it's, uh, it's set a huge issue. It means that we are uh, uh, long-term, uh, uh, the, the, the return on investment, uh, it's a long-term uh, question for us. 
So it's, a, it's an, an industry where you need a lot of equity, a lot of capital to, to be deployed. So uh, the major issue today is our cycle are shorter and probably the need of flexibility is means also shorter contracts, for example. Uh, it means that you have to be better uh, to, to, to keep your clients, but it's the same for the hotel business. Huh? If clients are not happy, they don't come back. So it will become the, the also, for me, the, the, the question for offices. If people are not happy, they will not stay with you. So you have to bring something more, not only a building, but also a, a, a relationship and to build on that uh, very strongly. And it does seem there will be a bit of dispersing of office locations to other places, as you mentioned, that this is quite bad news for the likes of some central business districts or I, I live, for example, near Canary Wharf in London and there are just huge hulking office buildings that are nearly nearly empty. So what do we do with those spaces and is this shakeout quite dangerous for the office industry? I, I would say after there is a, after, I don't think it will be uh, like this in one, uh, in one minute, but uh, of course it's an issue and we have to think about uh, how we can transform those buildings so it creates new opportunity. And of course there is a question around the value, uh, how we are able, uh, all the organization, the, the, the investor, we are able to, uh, to follow these trends and to, uh, to deliver, I would say, uh, new products. Uh, but it's a major deal uh, for sure. I don't mean that for me those districts are, are dead tomorrow, but it's exactly what happened, for example, in La Défense, is the way you have to recreate a, a life and a city. For me, uh, it's definitely the end of uh, a pure mono-asset district and versus a piece of cities with, uh, uh, where you can find uh, uh, cultural experience, you can also, uh, you can work, of course, but you can meet, you can enjoy, you can entertain, etc. So, so for me, it's this idea, and we have to look at those, uh, and probably it will accelerate the trends, and we have to find a way, both public and private sector, to, uh, to push the transformation of those districts. Yeah, we'll have to be a holistic approach. Uh, really. Now let's turn to Gregory. Uh, now you are with Club Med, and Obviously, challenge is a pretty uh, is a is a pretty small word for the big for the big issues facing the hospitality sector at this moment in time. So, how how is Club Med coping with that, and and are there any bright sparks that you can see? Thanks, Courtney. Uh, the first thing is, as for once we have an audience, I would like to do one little thing, which is a bit of an interactive exercise. Who in the audience did? go for holiday this summer. Can you raise your hands? Okay, nearly everybody. Was it good? Can you raise your hands? Good, but that's the good news you were looking for. And for you, I must say that this is the best part of your year. Of your year. <laughs> the next thing, if we speak about tourism, a bit about Club Med, but tourism. The first thing is for a while there was no tourism. And that's very new. That was extremely challenging on leaders there was no visibility on what was coming next, where you could go, when, with which constraints, which for leaders has been an exercise of adapting all the time, extremely intense. Then tourism developed this summer, first nationally, then regionally, and not further than regionally. This tourism was with constraints, sanitary constraints, I must say that these constraints are our day-to-day -day business in hospitality, but they've been pushed further with a, a big issue, which is how do you make it lively as a club net with sanitary constraints. I believe that this has been a success on our side, but this sanitary necessity will remain as a long-term trend, not with the mask and everything, but people are more aware about sanitary issues and it will remain in the hotel industry as something that's gonna be uh, in the future. Now another learning it is this summer we had leisure tourism. There was no business tourism. I do believe that leisure to me, tourism will come back. As you said, Olivier, it will come back. The question is when business tourism will come back also. But with what we have experienced over the last six months, it will come back differently. And those players who are absolutely focused on business tourism will have to restructure to adapt, which in terms of the CD, because I'm speaking about holidays, but the subject is your Bonnie Pim, uh, 
has got an impact. There will be bankruptcies, there will be things to restructure, and there will think, be things to rethink for the future, uh, and probably opportunities. Now that's the short term and a bit of long term on business tourism. Um, the point I would like to make is try and see a bit longer term on tourism and how this longer term may affect cities eventually. The, bi the biggest topic or polemics about tourism over the last few years, if you remember before COVID, was about the carbon impact of tourism. The flight chain, for instance, or the mass tourism. This is something that at one stage will have to be dealt with. There is two options. Either you travel with the wind on one side, or you stop traveling. I personally don't believe in either of them, as you said, Olivier. Uh, and for instance, because stopping traveling is like stopping smoking. You know that traveling may hurt the planet or smoking may hurt yourself, but when you do it, it's extremely good and you don't feel that you're killing yourself. So I don't think we'll stop traveling, but I think it's gonna change. I think we will travel less often, but longer. And that's where COVID has got a very specific role in all this. Because the COVID period is acting or has acted as a catalyst on two major things that I think will change tourism or answer this, um, this subject for the future of carbon impact of tourism. First is home office. Second is home teaching. Home office is a success. We all know that it cannot be long term, it cannot be all the time, but it can be. My point of view is that it will evolve partly to vacation office. Now imagine for your next uh, winter holidays, instead of going one week and having your kids one week at home uh, idle, you go two weeks, but one week you work from the distance. Then you can do this in February, you can do this in April, and July and August. This provided, of course, that you, get, you have a solution for your kids, and that's where some players can bring something, like Club Med, but that also has a future impact on cities and urban development, because instead of having Paris empty during seven, eight weeks per year, what you will have is Paris empty during 15 to 12 to 20 weeks, eventually. So how does the city adapt to this emptiness during the periods where people will be in a position to work from their vacation place away from the city? And the second element, which will change things also, is home teaching. Imagine now if kids can be teached from the distance on their holiday place, on their vacation place, on another place than the city or the school, which we have experienced during the lockdown. It will completely free the vacation or the holiday or the resort business because you could imagine people staying away for a longer period of time, which will have an extremely positive impact environmentally, socially, because you would free from something that is a stupidity, which, we, which is the holiday seasonality. Today, tourism is building infrastructure for French people for two months during summer, two weeks during April, two weeks uh, during the festive weeks. The rest of the time, half empty, half plain empty, and that doesn't make any environmental sense, any economical sense. So if you can free yourself from going to work, to office to work part of the year, and if you can free yourself from going to school for teaching for part of the year, you kill seasonality, you better use your touristic assets, you help the cities because you lower down the pressure of people. Let's say if there is 10% less people in Paris all year long, you will feel it on the streets, you will feel it on the, uh, on the suburbs, on the everything, and it will bring something new and fresh to, your, to our society. Uh, as Olivier was saying, it's not tomorrow, but if we want to see the long-term evolution, I do believe that this is part of it.
It, it sounds like what we're talking about, whether it's from offices or tourism, is a is a spreading out amongst places, amongst you know, spreading out the season, spreading out the the location, spreading out the offices. So that could be a potential upside of the crisis. In terms of segments in tourism, how is luxury um, reacting and performing as opposed to budget or let's say normal travel? There's, if we take the Parisian uh, example. Luxury segment has had no tourism for a big part of the year uh, because it was and that's that's the the back part of the uh, partial unemployment uh, It became at one stage more profitable to be closed than to be open So better be closed because you can be reimbursed the staff expenses um, What went well is peripheric tourism uh, Some region in France welcoming usually French people went well did well Places usually used to welcome international foreigners and uh, travelers went wrong, like Paris, for instance. So regional tourism, not city tourism for the summer, um, and more accessible because French people, for most of them, uh, unfortunately, do not have as high revenues and capabilities in tourism as the international of this world that are traveling to France usually. Yes, and most of Europe's been deprived, um, thanks to COVID, of American travelers coming and spending a ton of money in France in particular. Um, so that will all have its impact. So let's turn uh, to Laurent. Now, from an investment perspective, what are the implications? I mean, in investors typically don't like uncertainty, and they've got more, more of it right now than they, they could possibly fathom. So what do we do? So, so you're right. There are a lot of uncertainty. Uh, uh, for the time being, and as long as uh, this crisis, we're, we're speaking about uh, the lessons, etc. But it's still ongoing. That's the reality. So there are still a lot to, to, to be learned. But um, I would say, generally speaking, uh, the, the crisis have just acted as a catalyst or an accelerator of trends which were already there. Uh, we're speaking about uh, home office. It's not something which appeared uh, suddenly uh, when uh, the lockdown was uh, was imposed in, in, in different countries. Uh, it was already there. There was a lot of reservation, how it works, do we give it a lot of freedom. It has been a massive real-time experience. People now acknowledge that it works, so we know that it will probably be a big push on, on that front. So the, the office sector will be challenged on, on, that, uh, on that basis, not necessarily because uh, there will be no more office in the future. Uh, we need still, uh, we still need to have an office to gather people, to create a culture of a company. The lockdown is okay because most of the people know each other, so they can work remotely and they limit, let's say, social contact, but it cannot be sustainable. So office will be needed, probably different type of offices, uh, which was already, I would say, for the new built uh, product addressing this kind of need, probably more difficult or obsolescence for older building will be probably uh, increased uh, significantly. Uh, so, so the question is more about the pace of adaptation of the market to the change in demand. And real estate is not the most flexible uh, type of asset to adapt. And it's not just about the physical characteristic of the building. I was sharing uh, uh, with a lot of attention on Hidalgo, but it's also about regulation. I think the, the cities need also to accept that they, they need to provide a very flexible environment. We were deciding that this park should be an office area. They, they need to be able to change very quickly the use uh, 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 of the asset in order to keep alive the city and not um, empty zones uh, as it may appear. So I would say when we look to the current sectors, it's the pace of change for, for the office and, and, uh, and, um, and the retail sector, based on trends which were already there. Uh, the, the surprise, in fact, the, the asset class for me, which was having a significant uh, tailwind and was caught by surprise on this crisis is the, the hospitality sector. Very clearly, global travel, the trends were very positive. Uh, so, so this one, I, I agree with what uh, has been said that long-term prospect should be still good. The big question is when people will start uh, coming back to a more normal and if the demand uh, will change. So I was hearing very, uh, with, with a lot of interest, uh, the, the, the views. Uh, here because uh, that's a big question mark when you're trying to forecast what is the right place and the right type of product you will need to, 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 to have as an investment for the future. It, it comes back as well to 
what the initial question you were asking me about these things. Like I, I think the, the investment management um, uh, job is evolving because the asset and the underlying assets are also the requirements are, are, are different. I would say so some years ago we are just about using space, providing the space to a tenant once the space was let, no more have our business. Uh, today it's becoming much more operational. You need completely to understand what are the needs of your end users, what is the product you want to offer, how you adapt it. So it's much more intensive. You need to have people who have a much broader skill set than, uh, than, than before. So that's part of the transformation of the industry and it will be probably significantly increased uh, in the future. People were doing 10 years ago, a shopping center feeling that uh, retail is a safe place to be, and it has been for a very long time a very safe place to be. Now they need to really think about the product, how they attra attract footfall in order to keep their, their, uh, their, their tenants, so partnering with uh, your tenants. That's a complete different skill set than just using space. Uh, hospitality, this many people were doing hotels not thinking about what is the underlying business which are the clients, leisure, business traveler, how it can be impacted, etc. They have no choice. They need to understand what is going on in the hotel because the tenants are not in good shape. That's the reality. Their business is, is suffering a lot. So that's our part of the changes we are working yeah, there's Some disparity in the different segments in terms of their challenges and recovery prospects, but how do we see things regionally as well? Are you bullish on any particular um, markets where you see investment opportunities? So unfortunately, uh, I use also to, 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 to work on a lot on portfolio diversification. This time that didn't, didn't work, it didn't work at all. So the asset class has been heard the same way in all territories, or nearly. So um, uh, I don't think that it's more a question of territory than asset class. Uh, clearly, uh, the, 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 the logistic sector, the reshuffling of all uh, the distribution uh, is having still uh, a, a lot of, uh, of, uh, of um, uh, tailwind. And it might be part of the solution also for some of the retail and we're coming back about the use of uh, the building uh, within the cities. One of the challenges is the last mile delivery and last mile delivery is the most costly because you're in dense urban uh, areas. So th th there would be probably some, um, let's say, uh, way to address smartly this, this through probably a bit less of retail needs within the cities or potentially a bit of less of office needs in, in, uh, inside the city. Uh, data center. It's a no-brainer to go to us uh, already having a, uh, a very strong trend. Uh, it is clearly a big, um, uh, let's say, winner of, of what is happening. Uh, residential has shown its, resi its uh, resilience, uh, but it's not without any question. We are thinking about uh, home working. Will it change the, the, the location need? Uh, because if you are commuting only two days a, a week, do you need exactly to be on the same place? Uh, people who have experienced working the lockdown in small apartments might prefer to have a bit more of, uh, of uh, space and uh, even if it's at the price of having a longer travel. So I think that, that's the question mark. Suddenly urban dwellers desperately need a balcony or a garden that maybe didn't bother so much about before. I'm curious about the impact on, uh, when we think about office space, about co-working spaces. Um, and I wonder, uh, Olivia, you might have a view on this. I mean, with this new need for flexibility, um, that, that should lend itself to um, increased attractiveness for co-working spaces because they are kind of built on flexible leases. At the same time, there's, I suppose, a, a health and safety issue of bringing, you know, disparate groups of people together. You know, for, 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 for us, what I see in the market is co-working is a little bit... Uh, not exactly the right word, it's much more, I would say, of flexible offices because when I look at uh, uh, the offer provided by all the players in the market, it's much more uh, dedicated office with a, a wide range of services and full flexibility in the contract in terms of duration and also the capacity for certain players to, uh, to keep your, uh, your culture and to privatize your own offices. Uh, and for me, uh, for sure, it will reinforce the attractivity because uh, uh, as I said, it's a combo today. And uh, when I, 
when I, uh, when I meet some, I would say, executives, I say, okay, we are thinking about remote working from home or for a third place. It's for sure something we will do tomorrow. The question is one day, two days, three days per, per week, and how we manage the organization efficiency. The second point is uh, we need an office, uh, in, I would say, in hard. We, we lease or um, we let or we are owner, uh, doesn't matter, but we have to have our own office. And after, there is a part of flexibility for secondary location, for example, or for a part of the needs we have, maybe one, one day per week, two day per week. And um, when all the people are coming to the office, for example, we need more meeting rooms, we need no, more workstation for a project and so on. And we have this possibility to, to have the flexibility. And, uh, and for me, I, it doesn't mean that it will become the, 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 the sole model, I think. Huh? Uh, we will have always both longer contract and, uh, and flexibility. Also longer contract because flexibility has a cost, so it's more expensive for the company. But uh, and, and longer contract, they can have the benefit of more incentives. And it's, uh, so it's a balance between the, the, the three solutions. And Paul, from a talent perspective, uh, I guess flexibility is important too, and, and how crucial is it now in terms of to attract the top talent, what should companies be trying to propose and offer them in terms of flexibility about where they work and what the facilities are like? Of course, uh, this is definitely a, a, a new parameter in the offer and, and in the perspective of developing the, the, the new leaders, uh, giving them flexibility. It's also a challenge regarding management rules and management culture because you have a lot of pressure, and especially in the real estate sector, on the, on, on the team leaders to, to make the, the new generation grow and, and, and be able to really develop themselves where we, it is more difficult to do when you have more flexibility also in the younger generation. So, the challenge of leading teams in the real estate sector is already very, very strong. And if you add the flexibility in the younger generation, that is another challenge to the, on, on the shoulders of the, of, the, of, the, of the team leaders. So we must be very careful there. And I think from the top and from the governance of the companies, there must be a specific concern there to give to the team leaders the capacity to really do their job to, to make the team grow. This is a specific challenge which is uh, going out, out of the, the crisis. And do you think they're overall meeting this challenge well? Uh, I think at the end, the, the, the corporate companies, or the real estate companies who, are, who will have a, the better view on that, the capacity to really, um, let's say, implement a new strategy for developing the talents and the leadership will be the winners. Thank you. And I, I want to just come back to tourism for a moment as we get close to uh, ready to take some take question from the audience. And Gregory, what can the public sector do to support the tourism industry at such a vulnerable time? What what actually helps? I'm, 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 I'm afraid what would help is, is not in their capability, which is visibility uh, and constants in the direction considering all the unknown things about how we're going to de deal with the, uh, the COVID, it's very difficult for them to, uh, to bring this. Um, that's the long uh, histories, investing in infrastructure and in transportation infrastructure, investing in properties, and that's what the Caisse des Depots in France is uh, planning to do, uh, and that also works because they can take some project that normal investors may not take, but would help the territories. That's definitely helpful. Uh, but I would say consistency in what we want hoteliers or hospitality to be doing in their place. Because without consistency, we can't plan, we can't operate, we can't satisfy the guests, and we can't reassure the guests on the fact that it's okay to, uh, to go for a, a place. Thank you. And I think we'll take in a, in a minute or two a question from the audience, but I, I would just like to return to Laurent and what do you see at this moment in time as the most underappreciated or under the radar investment opportunity? Maybe you don't want to tell us, maybe it's your it's secret. secret. Um, I, I don't think that there is a, a, a huge discrepancy. I think there have been some asset class which has been uh, uh, 
uh, not fully considered uh, in the past, and, um, and I think that we have been pushing a lot on it, which is about double housing. Uh, there is a conviction that uh, th th there is, uh, and not affordable housing to make a, 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 a huge return when you are able to raise the rent to a, a, a top market uh, to top market level. It's, it's really about risk return. The affordable housing is, is really providing basic needs to the population. Uh, the, 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 the returns will be relatively low, but uh, the cash flow will be extremely resilient. So I've been pushing a lot on that. Uh, and, um, and this one was not a big target, I would say, uh, so far. And, and there has been a lot of uh, willingness to go into the residential market, but most of the time it was to upgrade significantly uh, badly maintained uh, assets or under-rented situation in order to extract a lot of value, uh, which create a lot of tension, because that's the asset class which is politically extremely sensitive. Uh, so also being able to provide the right type of product to maintain the mixed city in cities, I think it, it, it is a very interesting tool. And doesn't work for all type of player. You need to, to, to have the, the, the right type of capital being able to, to pursue this kind of, of uh, strategy. Thank you. And I want to see, do we have a, a question from the audience yet? The answer is yes. Yes, let's have it. <laughs> Uh, so th there's, a, there's a question, um, how to find the good balance between socialization and teleworking, remote working, how to redesign existing places to turn them into more flexible buildings and places? Who wants to answer this question? I, I can answer about the, the, the building. It's, a, it's clearly an issue and it's the, the question, uh, as Laurent said, of uh, the obsolescence and the acceleration of obsolescence. What, when, when, we, when we are dealing with the flexibility, it means uh, a discussion yesterday, uh, a very simple example. The, example, the, 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 the guy was, uh, was asking, say, I want to put my meeting rooms everywhere in the building without any constraints, and I want to be able to change it each year if needed. So for us, it's a main issue because you have to uh, probably spend a little bit more money in, uh, when you are designing the building. To, to keep this flexibility, and, uh, and it means also uh, uh, the density in the building. You have to be to, to have uh, larger staircases. Staircases. You have to, uh, to 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 provide also the question of sanitary measure, the, the fresh air everywhere, the possibility to, uh, uh, to to cut all the system if needed, and to open the window. Uh, all those topics and, uh, and about the flexibility, physical flexibility. It's increased. Uh, technical constraints, but it's possible to do it. It means that we have to transform existing building, and in our project today, we have to integrate this new uh, paradigm uh, in our design. For the flexibility in the contract, it's a, it's a little bit more complicated because it's, a, uh, I would say, real estate investors are looking for regular return, and so the volatility of the, the return is a, is, a, is, a, is a main issue. So uh, again, of course, you have to reinforce the attractivity of your product, but uh, you have to mitigate also, it's our perspective for Covivio, and to mitigate the, 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 the risk between long-term contract and to have, a, I would say, well-balanced uh, risk between long-term contract and, and shorter, shorter contract with uh, co-working, for example. Any other questions? Yeah, and there's another question for, for all the panelists. Uh, do you have a key relevant uh, or, or several key, uh, relevant actions to lead and, uh, and to, to enable mobility for living, working, traveling, socializing? Who wants to answer this question? The question of mobility. Mobility, and important as, as commuting patterns and everything changes. Who yeah. has some keys to that? I think Gregory uh, raised that with the mobility regarding uh, tourism and, and leisure uh, activities, but uh, I think for, for the cities, uh, it's more on your side, I guess. So, so I, I think uh, for, for um, uh, the mobility, there will be changes. So we are mentioning uh, uh, the way we are interacting between people. My personal experience during the lockdown is that to a certain extent, level of interaction with remote teams has been much better. Uh, where I felt initially that I would need to be uh, in each territory, uh, we have teams on a very regular basis, maybe uh, once every two to three weeks. 
this need would be fairly much less because we have been using fact now naturally tools which enable a good level of interaction uh, with, uh, with, uh, with our teams. Um, so that's w one thing. The other on uh, the city that itself and the built environment, uh, there have been a lot of discussion regarding density. And so obviously uh, looking for uh, lower density given uh, the, the consequence of the, the, the pandemic. I strongly believe that we have no choice than the choice of density for two reasons, which are economic and, uh, and, and ecological uh, reasons. Uh, economic, because if you want really to provide to people good infrastructure, social infrastructure, health infrastructure, you have no choice than to have enough people in a very limited uh, uh, space. So the second is the footprint of real estate. The, the less dense environment, the, the broader use of uh, the, the uh, of land you are doing, and which create other issues regarding uh, uh, biodiversity, impact of human activity on, 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 uh, on um, our environment. So density will be important, uh, and this density with flexibility of use should enable to increase the use of, uh, of uh, cycles. Uh, I think the renting model versus ownership model is also uh, a big topic because you, don't, you can't easily manage uh, high mobility and home ownership. Uh, so that's part also of the equation. You need to be able to, to move uh, very easily. So th there are a number of topics which will be evolving, but it's involving so many different players that uh, aligning everyone to, to, to make this uh, happen in a, in a, in a let's say, um, efficient way is, is always a challenge. Um, I suppose for you, Gregory, mobility is, is not so much moving around in the city, but longer, you know, longer haul mobility Traveling and people being road, able yes. to travel, um, what, what would help there? Again, it probably comes back to the infrastructure and I suppose um, um, ease of uh, visa facilitation and all those, all those bureaucratic, bureaucratic things as well. Uh, I, I would say, as I said before, that travel will be less often, but longer. Same for uh, commuting. Huh? Maybe you're not going to commute for uh, 30 minutes every day, but you're going to commute for one hour every other day. So if you think everything this way, even long distance travel, how do you adapt to the fact that people may travel less often, but longer time? Uh, and, and all this, I think we are at the beginning of it. So uh, to say what the authorities sh should do, uh, what type of investment they should do is a bit premature probably, but that's definitely the mindset in which we should, uh, we should aim. Then, of course, uh, short term, you asked me what authorities could do to help. It's open borders that would help definitely for tourism and for traveling. And I think having taken a flight of, over the last few months with the mask and everything, it goes okay. So there is no reason for closing the borders for this reason and for not traveling. Um, and facilitate whatever type of uh, uh, flows you can have and whatever type of bureaucracy you can have. Of course, that's been the case for. Ile de France, le rendez-vous tout à l'heure. Merci de nous suivre ici à cette musicale ou en visio. And uh, we will so now meet in the lobby for lunch and uh, a chance to, no to network. See you. Merci beaucoup.